Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilmember Robert Carnegie, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. We're here today to hold a hearing on the high upfront cost of finding and renting an apartment in New York City. New York City is a city of renters, with rental apartments making up nearly two-thirds of the housing stock. Although New York remains in the midst of an affordable housing crisis, the crisis is not just limited to high rents. Renters are faced with unaffordable costs just to be able to find and then sign a lease on an apartment. Many landlords retain real estate brokers to help them find prospective tenants. While tenants are free to hire brokers of their own accord, in many instances, tenants find that they have had no meaningful choice when the broker has been hired by the building owner. It is not unusual for a tenant to be charged a fee of up to 15% of the apartment's annual rent by the broker who facilitated the rental transaction. <clears throat> including in, in instances where the broker was retained by the building owner, not by the prospective tenant. This can bring otherwise affordable apartments out of reach of many tenants. In addition, prior to entering into a lease agreement, many landlords require tenants to pay non-refundable fees for tenant background checks and credit reports. In some cases, landlords may even require tenants to pay for those reports knowing full well that the apartment may not be available to the tenant. In some instances, these fees are simply listed as application fees and tenants are left in the dark as how these fees are being spent. When renters sign leases for apartments, they're expected to come up with many thousands of dollars up front, including broker's fees, security deposit, and background check fees. It's untenable to require people to have such large sums on hand, and in some cases, this requirement results in people remaining in unsafe housing because they cannot afford to move. Today, we'll be hearing legislation that seeks to limit the upfront costs faced by many tenants in the rental process, providing flexibility, in the payment of these costs and provide much needed clarity to the process to make housing more accessible to all New Yorkers. Proposed intro 1423A, sponsored by Council Member Powers, would limit the fees that a residential tenant may, must pay to a broker in a real estate transaction to one month's rent, or 8.3% of the annual rent, when the broker represents the landlord in the transaction. It would not prevent this broker from collecting an additional fee from the landlord, nor would it prevent a bro broker from collecting a fee that exceeds one month's rent when the tenant has hired the broker. In 1424, also sponsored by Council Member Powers, would limit rental security deposits to one month of rent. Proposed intro 1431A, sponsored by Council Member Rivera, will require the return of a security deposit within 14 days of the end of either a commercial or residential lease ensuring the tenant's money is returned in a timely fashion to help meet upfront moving costs. Intro 1433, also sponsored by Councilmember Rivera, would permit, would permit residential tenants on leases of at least six months to pay security deposits in installments to help alleviate some of the burden of having to pay a lump sum. Intro 1430, 1432, which Councilmember Rivera also sponsored, would provide transparency for residential rental application fees by requiring brokers to provide tenants with itemized explanations of application fees. Finally, intro 1499, sponsored by Councilmember Cohen, would in part require a landlord to provide a tenant with a copy of a tenant screening report if the tenant paid for that report. I'd like to, take my, I'd like to thank my fellow committee members present today, Councilmember Perkins, Councilmember Grudenchik, and Council Member Powers and acknowledge, uh, oh, that's all we have to start. Um, I'd like to remind everyone who'd like to testify today, please fill out a card with the Sergeant at Arms. We'll be sticking to a two minute clock for public testimony. And now we'll administer the oath. Oh. So I'm actually going to read the opening from Council Member Rivera after we hear the opening from Council Member Powers. Thank you. Thank you to the chair for allowing me an opportunity to, uh, to present a few opening an opening statement. Um, today, the Housing and Buildings Committee is considering two of the bills I've introduced alongside Councilman Rivera as part of a package of legislation to address upfront costs and protect consumers in rental transactions. I should, I should note, as a renter myself, I'm familiar with a number of these uh, issues and, and also the need for additional consumer protections. These bills seek to expand the historic protections for tenants that were passed by the New York State Legislature earlier this month. The first bill, Introduction 423, relates to rental transactions involving a landlord hired broker. The second, Introduction 1424, limits security deposits to one month's rent. 
I would note that the state legislature passed a similar uh, law to injunction 1424 as part of the rent regulation package earlier this month. My bill would allow the city to have an additional ability to enforce against this law. These bills seek to provide real consumer choice and fairness to New Yorkers at a time when our city is facing an affordability crisis. Half of New York's 5.4 million renters are rent burdened, meaning they spend 30% or more of their income on rent. We often focus on the monthly rent as a measure of affordability while forgetting the remaining costs that can equally hurt a potential renter and send them back financially. Upfront rental costs are astronomical. Since introducing legislation, we have heard dozens of stories from New Yorkers about the costs. I'll just give one example that was sent to our office after this bill was introduced. For, a for an apartment for $2,650 in Manhattan, a renter was told they needed to charge, uh, be pay, a broker fee of $4,770, a security deposit of $2,650, a $1,000 application deposit, a 500 move-in deposit, a $350 application processing fee, a $250 move-in fee, a $200 move-out fee, $55 credit check fee, a $50 online application to fee, a $45 submission fee, and finally a 5% credit card fee. That's $12,570 before even moving in. And I, don't, I know that that's not a everyday example, but certainly is something that causes concern. The stories that we have heard are countless. One resident, Jonathan from Queens, told us about the perfect apartment he found for his family, which was importantly within the walking distance of his synagogue, but couldn't sign the lease because he couldn't afford the required upfront fees of $10,000. He now moved from Queens to Long Island. And while these fees can be negotiable, renters like Thomas from Harlem told us that he's moved four times in the past 10 years and never has been able to negotiate them. I've heard from many of my constituents as well who work in the industry, and I take their concerns very seriously. I want to thank them, I won't name all of them, but I want to thank them who've taken the time with me to discuss their concerns, to get on the phone, to talk through the issues, and to continue to understand, for me, their issues and concerns with the legislation. I've been, I hope, open and willing to engage everybody in a meaningful and productive conversation. I think that is shown throughout this process, and I want to be very clear from the start. This bill has not or is not about limiting the income or hurting the hardworking brokers that have to skip that has to that have to skip family events, work long hours to make ends meet. And I would caution today those who are trying to describe this otherwise. The legislation clearly states nothing in this chapter shall limit the total fees any individual or individuals can collect in a rental real estate transaction. It's in the bill. The bill has always one made it, had one intention to make it more affordable to rent an apartment in New York City by asking one thing, for the landlords to pay for the people that they hire. At the end of the day, I believe, like I think many people in this room believe, that you're working hard to help that landlord and the service to me should be also paid for or at least contributed to by the person that has brought you into the transaction. This would put New York City in line with many other major cities throughout the country. I have a longer list of co comments, but I know we want to get to public testimony, so I'll skip them. I just want to say the last couple of things. I think there is a desperate need for transparency. Uh, today, if you go on Street Easy, a very popular source for rentals, no indication of whether uh, what the fee is being paid by the renter or even that's negotiable. Uh, even uh, like many other services, you can get upfront an understanding of the price and that it's negotiated. Um, and finally, I'll just say, uh, and I'll leave it there, but today we'll hear from renters who have been affected by those fees and representatives from the industry as well. I hope to focus on how these upfront costs affect mobility of New Yorkers, how these costs affect consumer choice for those looking for housing in New York City, and how we can make this system more equitable and fair. And this, of course, is entirely in a conversation in context of our homelessness crisis and our affordability crisis in New York City. I want to thank the numerous tenant organizations who have come here for support today, CAAV, Coalition for the Homeless, Coalition for Community Advancement, Good Old Lower East Side, HC, uh, HCC, Lower East Seaman Tenant Association, Met Council, Moving Forward, you need, you, uh, you, you need those Neighbors Together, New, Economic, New Economy Project, many, many more, Stabilizing NYC, Tenants and Neighbors, Legal, Legal Aid, and the, and the New York Housing Conference. Thank you for being here today and for your support. I look forward to testimony and continued conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Uh, as I said earlier, on behalf of Councilmember Rivera, I will read her opening statement. Councilwoman Rivera is deeply sorry she can't be here, but due to a family obligation, she's not able to attend today. 
I'll read this opening statement that she wished to give. Dear chairs and fellow committee members, thank you for allowing me to speak on intros 1423, 24, 31, 32, and 33, and 1499, which are hearing today, and I am proud to sponsor along with Councilmember Keith Powers. We all know that New York faces a massive affordability crisis, and one of the biggest problems facing tenants, particularly younger and lower income tenants, renters, is the slew of fees that must be paid before the tenant can occupy the apartment. One of the major costs associated with occupying a New York apartment uh, are the fees you have to pay to get the keys to your apartment, including the broker's fee and the security deposit. Today, broker's fees can reach 15% of the total annual rent of an apartment, nearly two months' rent. Security deposits typically cost one month of rent. However, this is not a standard, and there are instances where landlords charge arbitrary amounts. As median rents in Manhattan have reached nearly 3,500, my staff and I have heard from countless hardworking New Yorkers who have been confronted with upfront costs of nearly $15,000 to just receive the keys to an apartment. In fact, a member of the council's own staff told me that in their recent apartment hunt, they were informed that they would have to pay $13,570 for a Manhattan apartment that included fees that sounded outright dishonest or deceptive, such as a separate online application fee and digital submission fee, as well as move-in and move-out fees on top of a security deposit and a 15% broker fee. With rental costs at all-time highs, it is long past time that we tear down these unnecessary financial barriers for renters. I want to make clear that the goal of these bills is to provide an upfront affordability, predictability, and transparency. If a property owner hires a broker to market an apartment, why should tenants be expected to shoulder the cost? And how can we expect tenants to negotiate for a fair deal when tenants are desperate for an apartment and landlords hold all the cards? Unfortunately, the state does not currently collect data on broker's fees or security deposits, nor does Rebney or any other real estate association voluntarily report this data publicly. So you will have to instead hear today from real estate brokers, landlords, Rebney, and other associations about the people they've spoken to in the real estate industry who don't charge exorbitant fees. And you'll hear from tenants and tenant advocates about their experiences deciding whether to drain their life savings to be able to find a home. I want to thank my fellow bill sponsors for their tireless advocacy on the important issues, as well as the countless organizations fighting alongside us. I call on my colleagues to join us in supporting both these pieces of legislation, and I want to thank you for allowing me the time to speak today. That was Councilmember Carlina Rivera. Um, hmm? Yes, so I'd like to have um, to administrate the oath to the administration before their testimony. Right hands up. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in the testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I, I do. do. Great. You can uh, just identify yourself and begin your testimony uh, when you're ready. Great, thank you. Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Sarah Mallory, and I am the Chief of Staff for Government Affairs at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the issue of upfront rental fees and the proposed legislation on today's agenda. The de Blasio administration has focused on making this city more fair and affordable for everyday New Yorkers since day one. New York City continues to face a housing affordability crisis, and its residents continue to feel the strain of extraordinary market pressures. Given that the demand for housing consistently outpaces available supply, it is vital that we take a multifaceted approach to ensuring New Yorkers can afford the city they love. The city is committed to produce record numbers of affordable homes and has made strengthening the rent stabilization laws a key priority as they remain one of the best tools to protect tenants and are now even stronger. The New York State Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019 represents a historic achievement for the rights of millions of tenants across the city. This administration advocated for many of these changes alongside tenants, and the state legislature has now made rent regulations both stronger and permanent. We hear every day from New Yorkers who are afraid they won't be able to afford to stay here, and that's why the de Blasio administration is building and preserving record numbers of affordable housing, providing legal services to renters facing eviction, and so much more. The new state legislation finally puts the law on the side of the tenants. It will close loopholes that allow high rent increases, end vacancy and luxury decontrol, and the vacancy bonus and ensure that tenants won't have to fight for their lives in another four years by making the law permanent. HPD stood with New Yorkers as we fought for and won even stronger tenant protections, 
including those for non-rent regulated units. And the new law guarantees new protections for tenants in unregulated housing, many of which are similar to the protections proposed in legislation being considered here today. All renters in New York will soon benefit from transparency and clarity around security deposits, which will now be limited to one month's rent and come with mandated procedures to ensure that the landlord returns the security deposit within 14 days of vacancy. Unregulated tenants will see stricter limitations on what they can be charged in the application process, more protections for rental payments, and other important reforms. HPD takes seriously our own values-based approach to creating more fair and equitable housing opportunities. Since the start of Housing New York, HPD has financed approximately 122,000 apartments. Developers creating and preserving the city-sponsored affordable housing are required to follow the city's marketing and tenant selection procedures. In summer 2018, we updated our marketing policies that developers must follow to further limit how credit history impacts housing applicants, address and clarify complexities in income calculations, ensure special protections for survivors of domestic violence, and make the lottery selection process more efficient. These updates demonstrate the city's continued commitment to create more opportunities for all New Yorkers. Importantly, developers must also meet all of the steps outlined in the published marketing requirements before they are able to go forward with selecting applicants. As we continue to produce affordable housing at a record pace, we are equally committed to making the process of leasing up those apartments as equitable and efficient as possible. Further, despite the Trump administration's delayed implementation of the required assessment of fair housing, the City of New York remains committed to a comprehensive fair housing planning process to study, understand, and address patterns of residential segregation and concentrated poverty in our neighborhoods, and how these patterns impact New Yorkers' access to opportunity, including jobs, education, safety, public transit, and positive health outcomes. This data-driven, collaborative fair housing planning process is done through an initiative we call Where We Live NYC, and includes extensive community participation throughout all aspects of the process that will culminate with the release of a public report in the fall of 2019. The report will include measurable goals and strategies that are designed to foster inclusive communities, promote fair housing choice, and increase access, access to opportunity for all New Yorkers. More information on these efforts can also be found at wherewelive.cityofnewyork.us. The Council's partnership has been vital to the administration's efforts to give more New Yorkers the opportunity to find and maintain an affordable home. HPD appreciates and supports the intent of these bills presented by Council Members Rivera, Powers, and Cohen today, and thanks them for their leadership to reduce mobility barriers, create consistency, and help New Yorkers access new housing options that they can more easily afford from the start. HPD supports Introduction 1424, which codifies at the local level that security deposits can be capped at one month's rent, and the requirements of Intro 1431, which codifies that security deposits for residential units must be returned within 14 days of the end of a lease. HPD looks forward to working with the Council to review these bills to ensure that the language is consistent with the recently enacted state legislation. We also support the intent of introduct introductions 1432, 1433, and 1423, but want to make more time to review the specific language in these bills to consider how they interact with the current state law and recently enacted amendments. And although my colleague at the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection will expand on this further, HPD also agrees that fees should not be charged to tenants for obtaining a tenant screening report if a unit is not available for rent. We look forward to continuing these conversations to ensure New Yorkers have transparency, clarity, and more housing options in the rental process. Thank you, and I'll now take any questions. Good morning, Chairman Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Casey Adams, and I am the Director of City Legislative Affairs for the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, recently renamed the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of DCWP Commissioner Laura Lee Salas about Introduction 1499, a bill that would prohibit charging a fee for obtaining a tenant screening report for a unit that the landlord or broker sh uh, should know is not available for rent, unless the parties agree otherwise in writing. Intro 1499 would also require DCWP to conduct a feasibility study on whether the city could establish a public tenant screening report system. Currently, DCWP enforces the disclosure requirements that apply to any person who requests application information directly from prospective tenants. Requesters must disclose whether the information gathered will be used to obtain a tenant screening report and, if it will be so used, excuse me, which credit reporting agencies will be consulted. 
Uh, and I want to direct the committee's attention to the back of our testimony where I have um, copies of the current disclosures, so you can see those as I'm describing them. Reporters must also disclose certain protections available to tenants under federal and state law, the availability of free credit reports, and the opportunity for tenants to dispute inaccurate or incorrect information directly with consumer reporting agencies. In addition to making direct disclosure to prospective tenants, requesters are also required to post a sign in any location where the principal purpose is to conduct business transactions related to the rental of re residential real estate, notifying prospective tenants about which consumer reporting agencies will be used to produce tenant screening reports, the availability of free credit reports, and the opportunity for tenants to dispute accurate or incorrect information directly with these agencies. Violations of these provisions are punishable by a civil penalty of $250 to $500, and first-time violations may be cured to avoid a penalty. Since 2014, DCWP has received 17 complaints related to tenant screening reports, the majority of which were from the Bronx. In that time, DCWP conducted 812 patrol inspections of businesses covered by these provisions and issued 114 violations for either failure to disclose or failure to post required signs. These violations result in the issuance of an average of $3,125 in civil penalties annually, with a total of $18,750 in civil penalties issued since 2014. DCWP supports the prohibition on charging a fee for obtaining a tenant screening report for a unit that the landlord or broker should know is not available for rent, unless the parties agree otherwise in writing. Tenants should not be forced to pay a fee for a report that is meant to assist landlords in evalu evaluating their suitability if the unit for which they are applying is not, in fact, available to rent. Knowingly charging a tenant screening report fee for an application to a unit that the landlord or agent knows is unavailable is deceptive and may already be actionable under the city's consumer protection law. DCWP therefore supports cl clarifying our enforcement authority by explicitly prohibiting this practice in the administrative code. We do not believe that the report required by intro 1499 would be useful at this time. First, as mentioned in testimony, DCWP's enforcement authority with respect to tenant screening reports focuses on the making of disclosures and posting of signs, both of which are core components of general consumer protection and leverage our existing capacity for patrol inspections of businesses. We do not currently inquire into the specifics of how tenant screening reports are produced and what factors are appropriate for consideration, nor are we equipped to do so as an agency. We do not think that DCOWP would be the right agency to conduct a, a study like the one required by Intro 1499. Second, recent changes in state law, as my colleague discussed, are likely to significantly change the way that landlords use tenant screening reports and what information is contained in them. Under the new state law, landlords are only permitted to charge a fee to reimburse costs associated with conducting background and credit checks. This fee is capped at the actual cost of the checks, or $20, whichever is less. Landlords must waive the fee if a potential tenant provides a copy of a background or credit check conducted within the past 30 days. Fees for background and credit checks may not be collected unless the landlord provides the prospective tenant with cop excuse me, copies of the reports and a receipt or invoice from the entity that conducted the checks. Landlords will also now be prohibited from basing a decision not to rent on a tenant's history of involvement in housing court, a practice commonly referred to as tenant blacklisting. There will be a rebuttable presumption that a landlord has violated that law if he or she requests a tenant screening report containing that information and subsequently refuses to rent to the tenant who is the subject of the report. The new provisions are enforceable by the state attorney general. These important gains at the state level could address many of the concerns underlying the study required by Intro 1499, but there hasn't yet been enough time to gauge the impact on tenants and landlords. We recommend monitoring the impact of new state law requirements before studying, uh, starting a study at the local level. DCWP shares the Council's concern with ensuring that New Yorkers are not deceived, misled, or overcharged when they go apartment hunting, which, as we've heard, is already hard enough. We believe that expressly prohibiting the charging of tenant screening report fees for unavailable units is a positive step, and we support that part of the bill before you today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm now happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much both for your testimony. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. There are uh, I've been told about a thousand people outside who'd love to be inside testifying. So we're going to ask uh, council members to be on a three minute clock in an effort to hear from as many people as we possibly can today. I'm, I'm actually going to limit my remarks 
and make sure that there is room for my colleagues to be able to ask their questions. So I just have a few questions to begin, and then I'll be going directly to my colleagues for their questions. Uh, on intro 1423 in relationship to limiting the fees charged in a rental real estate transaction, what percentage of the annual rent is generally charged as a broker fee? So thank you, Council Member, for that question. You know, HPD does not have insight into these private business transactions that are currently regulated at the state level. Um, we would be happy to speak with the Department of Consumer Fraud and Protection Bureau at the Attorney General's Office and the Department of State and continue conversations in order to get more information on that. I'd like for you to get back to me as soon as possible on yep. those rates uh, as prescribed by the state. Absolutely. Uh, what, what would be the percent, I'm sorry, what would the percent be if this bill were enacted? Can you speak to that? even without having, because we're now talking about percentages and not an actual Yeah, number. sure, so assuming that this is roughly one month's rent and therefore one twelfth, it's about 8%, which is a more general. In assisting tenants to secure housing, does HPD facilitate the payment of broker fees at 15% or more of the annual rent? So HPD really cares about making sure that there are opportunity for housing and in our own affordable housing deals and projects that go through HPD marketing process, uh, initial lotteries at any income level do not have broker fees at all. Uh, I just want to state for the record that we've been joined by Council Member Andy Cohen. Um, oh, sorry, and Council Member Margaret Chen. Uh, what is generally charging these fees? Do broker fees amounts vary between building owner and tenant hired brokers? What um, are you seeing as, as, as HPD? Yeah, so again, because this is more regulated at the state level, I think that the, our counterparts in the Attorney General's office uh, can provide a little bit more insight into that or the Department of State. Um, but anecdotally, you know, I would say it's a variety and depends very widely based on um, a variety of factors. In rental real estate transactions, who typically hires the broker? Um, so again, this is overseen by the Department of State, so I'd have to get back to you with that information. So, so obviously the concern is there is there more is should we be legislating for more power to be bestowed upon um, the city and the administration to be able to help regulate some of this? Absolutely. So again, I think we support the intent of these and are happy to have continuing conversation um, with the law department and our state partners who currently have oversight and also our partners in the private sector who have private mechanisms around this as well. So as a council, we have, I believe we have a reasonable expectation to believe that some of the regulatory, some of the regulatory burden re relies on HPD. Um, what, what role does the city play in the regulation of brokers, if any? Um, so, great question. Again, it is uh, in the instance in which HPD has been working on our marketing process and with our finance, those are the additional tools and hooks that we have at this time to not allow brokers fees upon an initial lease up. In the private market, there are private mechanisms and the court systems uh, around that as well. So only the, only the buildings under HPD purview do you have a regulatory um, ability in terms of rentals and in terms of fees and broker fees yes. to administrate? So there are additional, again, there are additional pieces in the private market and the state, but correct. These are business transactions outside of HPD's purview. Um, I have a second round of questions that I'm gonna, I know that my colleagues uh, have other hearings, so I'm going to go directly to uh, Council Member Powers, I believe, is first. Thank you. Just two quick questions at the beginning. Um, can you tell us the vacancy rate in New York City right now, and can you tell us how many rental transactions happen on an annual basis? Do you have that data? Yeah, so I don't have the specific on me. I think the vacancy rate is about 3%, um, and I can get you the exact number, I think it's 3.6. Um, and sorry, can you ask your second question one more? And how many rental transactions happen yearly? Um, so we don't have specific to rental transactions every year. We have a snapshot in time based on the recent housing vacancy okay, survey. Okay, if you. Yeah, and so we estimate that about 300,000 
uh, households moved into their unit in 2016, which is as a result of our 2017 housing vacancy survey. So 300,000 new moves in New York City in 2016, is that right? Correct. Okay. For consumer affairs, um, 300,000 transactions happening. Can you tell us right now the role the city consumer affairs has in, in those rental transactions in terms of insuring consumer protection around them? So our general consumer protection law, which prohibits deceptive or unconscionable trade practices, would ap generally apply to those transactions, but only to the extent um, that it's not preempted by state law. So that specifically regulates a housing transaction. So if there are cases where we feel that the behavior of a private actor is deceptive or unconscionable, then we will investigate that and we can bring an appropriate action either at an administrative tribunal or in state court. Got it. And uh, does, it, does the Consumer Affairs Agency, I mean, one of the points I raised earlier in my statements was that if I went on Street Easy today, for instance, I'm using that as an example. I know it's not where every transaction occurs. But the popular site, if I open up a listing, there's no fee, there's fee. If I open up a, one that has no fee, doesn't have no, that is supposed to have a fee on it, I don't have any indication of what the, either the range or the actual percentage of the fee I'm paying, nor do I have any language that I've seen uh, that says it's negotiable. Does that cause a concern around consumer protection? I think we generally feel that it is better for consumers to have more information. That's a separate question, I think, than whether that rises to the level of a deceptive trade practice under the consumer protection law, but certainly we agree that it is almost always positive for the consumer to have more insight into a transaction, more transparency on what types of fees will be uh, charged. And, and similarly to the same thesis, if I, my premise here is if I go out and I'm looking for an apartment in New York City today, I need assistance with that, either I'm, I'm working or I have moving to the city for the first time, I want to engage in hiring somebody. Today's legislation that we're talking about doesn't touch that transaction in any manner. The one that where I go out and I want to hire and I find, seek an apartment, the landlord has decided to put, you know, add somebody into that transaction who's I'm obviously working very hard for them. Um, you know, the tenant is then required to shoulder the entire cost. My proposal is you should split it. But um, does that cause concerns around a, a renter or a consumer, in this case, walking into a transaction without the ability to select their, a representative here or um, be able to negotiate the cost at the beginning of the transaction? I think that is, in, from our perspective as a consumer protection regulator, if the consumer goes into that transaction understanding the arrangement and the potential consequences, then, um, then that would be beyond the reach of the consumer protection law. Our, that general purpose law is really focused on situations where the activity of one actor deceives or misleads um, a consumer to their detriment. Uh, but if a consumer approaches a transaction in full knowledge of the facts, it generally does not fall under that law, no. Okay. I was just talking about more con general concern than a, whether it follows the letter of the law, but I'll continue. Um, the, in, a, in a transaction where one party has hired a service and uh, another party has to pay for the cost, it, it isn't, it, isn't there potentially a conflict where a landlord hired representative is now, um, is I'm paying, I mean, isn't there a conflict there is essentially a representative for one party, I'm entering that transaction, I'm asked to be paid for it, but essentially I, I don't get the service that the, same, the other party gets, yet still asked to shoulder the, the burden of the cost. So again, I think that our uh, coverage of that type of issue is limited because we are operating under a generally a general use uh, deceptive trade practices law. I think that there are, it's my understanding that there are regulations at the state level about uh, the duties of a broker or an agent generally, uh, which is not within our purview. So I'll, I'll leave that to others who have more knowledge. Um, but I think that uh, from our perspective, what we're focused on and what the current um, law on tenant screening reports is focused on is disclosure and putting the consumer in full knowledge um, of the facts okay. before they enter into the transaction. Um, and I'll just, I'll just ask one last question because I want to be respectful of time and people that are waiting. Um, are there alternative ideas that you might have in terms of how to protect consumers in a marketplace where there's a low vacancy and a very high demand for housing um, and other solutions you'd propose either to either regulate disrupt deceptive practices or certainly to enhance the consumer's protection and information in a, in a financial transaction, in this case in a rental transaction? Well, Councilmember, as I said, a lot of this comes down to our consumer protection law. Um, 
in terms of where our authority currently is. And, and we uh, have been working with the council. Councilmember Espinal has recently introduced a bill to bring, uh, to update that consumer protection law and to increase the fines toward um, a more modern standard uh, because those fines were set in 1969. Um, and so I think that's one possible way to, in, um, to augment our authority here. Uh, and we are always here to serve as a resource um, for consumer protection issues generally. And, and I'll go back to what I said earlier, which is that we generally feel that greater transparency is helpful because it puts a consumer in full knowledge of the facts and it gives them um, hopefully greater bargaining power or at the very least the ability to protect themselves if they discover that this isn't the type of transaction that they'd like to enter into. Okay, I appreciate that. I just, I just want to echo again that my feeling here is that in many cases, my district particularly is, is one example, people are walking into transactions without a lot of information up front about exactly what the cost will be to them. It's not loan to brokers. I'm not saying it's loan to them. Mm -hmm. It's on security deposits where they have to negotiate that at the end of the transaction often, and a whole litany of fees that I think get added into a transaction. I'd like to work with the, the, uh, the agencies to see on some of those other practices as well. But you know, again, I want to reiterate that my feeling here is the landlord should be paying for the service that they hire, and they should pay, they should pay generously because there are people working very hard on their behalf. And second, my proposal is a compromise where you'd split it. The renter shouldn't have to shoulder the entire burden. It says nothing about taking away pay from people. I think it's ensuring that the, sir, the person that hires the service has also a financial responsibility in that transaction. So thank you. Thanks to the chair. Uh, thank you, Sponsor Powers. Um, again, I'd just like to refer to uh, the clock going forward in three minutes. Um, we've also been joined for the record by Councilmember Helen Ro Rosenthal, um, and I believe we're going to hear from uh, Councilmember Cohen, who also has a bill in this suite. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I'm going to be very brief because I realize I'm sure m most of you people came out to talk and testify about uh, 1499, but I think that there are a lot of people here who are concerned about other pieces of legislation on this, uh, on this committee's agenda today. So I, I do appreciate the chair taking up the bill. I also appreciate the testimony. Uh, I, I look forward to actually working with the administration, perhaps offline. Uh, as you pointed out, the state legislature did pass legislation late in the session, uh, and I think trying to come up with a way to see if my legislation and what the state legislature did can uh, dovetail together to make sure. Uh, I will say also that, uh, you know, on the one hand, you could say that 17 complaints is a good sign that people are not complaining, or it could also be a sign that we're not doing a good job of kind of uh, servicing uh, constituents and consumers who may have issues that we're, that we're not getting to the root of. So again, I look forward to working with the administration, and I think that there will be an opportunity to do that. Uh, Chair, I didn't take up a minute, so I'm going to say thank you very much. Thank you so much for uh, your, your time concern. Um, intro 1432, in relationship to transparency and residential rental application fees. This is a very important one, uh, in my opinion. Uh, what information is currently disclosed to tenants regarding the expenses associated with an application fee? Um. So thank you, Council Member, for this question. I think the thing that I really want to highlight today is, again, those state changes that were just happened um, in the last few weeks in relation to the rent reform law. Uh, there were large historic changes around application fees itself um, that we're really excited about. So for example, uh, background check and credit check fees can be charged, the only things that can be charged for rental applications, and they cannot exceed $20. And then further beyond that, they cannot be charged and an applicant provides their own documentation. Um, and DCA also talked about this a little bit in their testimony, and I think this is a really important tool to provide transparency and clarity around application fee fees. And we look forward to working with our state partners in order to increase education and outreach around this and the newly formed mayor's office to prevent, protect tenants. And we're very excited to have Executive Director Jackie Bray work with us, all agencies involved, all levels of government in order to get this new standard and information out there. So what if any lists of standard fees and reasonable prices are available for tenants. So is there any place that a tenant can go and find out whether or not they're being charged fees that fall outside of HPD's purview or the state's purview? Yep, and just because it was passed about two weeks ago, we are working with our folks in order to figure out at the state level what that actually looks like and the implementation going forward. So we're happy to give an update to the council as soon as we have those conversations. So we'd love to have an update, Absolutely. but we think that it's in the consumer's uh, best Absolutely. interest to have some place that they can go, uh, both online or, or some place uh, that they can have a standard 
um, way of looking at what fees are acceptable. Absolutely. Because those landlords and or brokers who are unscrupulous um, and who are charging things that don't fall within our parameters, they should be al alerted to that. Absolutely. Uh, a consumer should be alerted to a tenant, potential tenant should be alerted to that almost immediately. Absolutely, and we're interested in adding that to our ABCs of housing, which is our guide for tenants' rights and working with HCR and all of our state partners as well. So um, while this is taking place and this reform is coming in place, are there typical fees involved in a rental application that you can point to right now before these changes take place? Because there's going to be a period uh, that people will be, thousands of, of people will be renting, you know, in a sh very short period of time. This is the season for moving, and most of us understand that, uh, between now and the fall. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know when the new reforms will be enacted. What's on the books right now? Yep, so there are additional phase in um, the official, this is again at the state level, so the state law, um, which we are excited to see these changes, will take effect immediately in some portions of the law uh, are phased in over time in the coming months. I believe, uh, and I can get back confirm for you, uh, but that the background check and credit requirements are effective immediately. So we will work to get that information out immediately in order to make sure that everybody knows. So um, obviously, you know, in my, I'm gonna date myself here, but there used to be a commercial that said, you know, a, a, uh, educated consumer is our best customer. I won't mention the company that said that, mm -hmm. um, but that is a that's that's a prescription for doing good business in the city of New York. Um, what are we doing as these new reforms are set to take place to educate potential tenants on what's available to them? What's the standard standardization of fees? What is the outreach process from HPD's perspective? And is HPD the responsible entity, yeah. or is it consumer affairs and, and customer protection? I'm sorry about the new name. <laughs> the acronyms drive me crazy. But um, who's, the, who's the proper entity for disseminating this new information and educating potential tenants on these new changes? Yep, so actually because these laws were enacted at the state level and we are seeking clarity and guidance, uh, this state, uh, is actually the ones responsible and we are working with them in order to come up with city outreach plans that work in coordination with them, uh, with all of our partners at the city that deal with tenants, uh, which is multiple, in order to make sure that we have a really clear, consistent, precise messaging. Um, and because the laws were just recently passed and there's a lot of clarity that's still coming as the lawyers work through it, uh, that will be coming very shortly. So we will give that information to you as soon as possible in coordination with all the parties. So I'm, I'm reluctant to put the entire onus for education on my state colleagues, yeah. <laughs> even though I have one of my favorite state colleagues who is present who will be testifying today. Yep. Um, we, I think we have, the, you know, the burden is, is on the city to some degree for education purposes. So while we know that these yep. laws are going to be propagated, propagated from the state, yeah. um, the best we can do is make sure that our consumers and tenants are aware and are educated properly. Right. What's the partnership between the city and the state on education? Yep, it and so I think, Councilmember, we actually really look forward to these education um, and want your help in doing that. So we would be happy to work with council offices in order to provide information on the updated law. HPD also has our mobile outreach van, um, housing ambassadors. We have uh, the Ready to Rent program, which we work in jointly with DCA in order to get folks ready for applying for our housing lottery applications. And a lot of this information can be disseminated through the many tools of outreach that we have. Um, I'd like to hear from uh, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, who has a question. Thank you, just a quick question. I appreciate that, Chairman Carnegie. Can I ask you both, um, it's great to see you. Uh, is, uh, does the bill, uh, Council Member Powers bill, does that say anything does it refer in any way or say anything about the take-home amount uh, for the broker? Does this bill at all affect what the broker will be paid? Do you want to say and, and I'll be honest and I'll be honest with everyone. I mean, the reason I'm asking is because I think the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And I think that this bill has to do with who pays the broker's fee, whether it's the landlord 
or the renter mm -hmm. or a combination. But just uh, there is uh, perception and reality for sure. But just like in terms of words on the paper, does it affect, is the, is the broker, I'm sorry, is, yeah, is the broker in the bill? Um, so thank you, council member, for your question. We really appreciate it. Um, our current interpretation, we want to make sure that we're looking at this with lawyers in order to confirm 100%. Um, thank you. And get back to you on that. Um, uh, I've chaired hearings before where there's an animated audience. If, if we could, um, it really helps a hearing just to share with you to, you know, if you like something, do this. If you don't like something, do this. We're trying to really just hear uh, testimony. Thank you. Um, so I want to say, again, I'm not a lawyer. I think tentatively that could be the case, but we want to make sure that we're confirming with lawyers and the full interpretation of the law and get back to you. Does DCA have an opinion on this? Uh, so for this package of bills, our enforcement authority is uh, in Councilmember Cohen's bill. Um, so we would not be involved in, in the enforcement of these laws. I mean, I, I asked because, and, I, and we'll be asking again to Rebney the same question, um, because um, the intent is not to have an impact on the broker's take-home pay. And the intent is for there to be a shared cost um, with no impact on the broker's pay. Um, so, you know, any help and help in legal help in clarifying that would be appreciated. Absolutely, and we'll thank look you. at the specifics of the language and get back to you. Thank you, thank you, mm -hmm. Chair Carnegie. My pleasure. Uh, does HPD require any disclosures be made to tenants during the residential rental application process? Uh, yes, they're required. There are a um, list of disclosures that vary from both the city and the state level. I don't have that full list with me, but I can get back to you depending on local law and other requirements. That's 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 important for us yeah. as a as a council, especially in in um, when there are very passionate um, and vocal opinions on both sides. Yep. It's important for us to have as much of that information as possible. Absolutely, and um, we agree transparency and clarity up front is very important. And council member, with respect to tenant screening reports specifically, the disclosure that I described in my testimony is required, and you can see a copy of that attached to our testimony. Thank you. Uh, for the record, we have been joined by council member Richie Torres. Um, So I want to thank you both for your testimony. We're going to move forward and hear testimony from um, uh, advocates and tenants. Thank we'll you. We'll start with the first panel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to hear from uh, Assembly Member Inez Dickens, who is a friend to this body and who has been very vocal on issues that are around um, tenants. And personally, for the record, I have to say, who's been a, a great mentor to me. Uh, welcome, Assembly Member. You can begin your testimony. It's very odd seeing you on that side of the table, but you can begin your testimony as, uh, as soon as you'd like to. Yeah, please. Uh, good afternoon, and I thank Chair Robert Cornegay um, and all the members of the committee uh, for allowing me this time to testify. I want to acknowledge my council member, Bill Perkins, and thank him for the work that he's done in our, uh, uh, right here, Bill. <laughs> uh, there's one thing I want to say, is that although this bill, council member Powell's bill, and thank you so much, um, uh, does not state brokers, 
the fact that it says in relation to limiting the fees charged in rental real estate transaction infers uh, salespersons and brokers. The other thing I want to make clear is that when a fee is charged, whatever it is, it's split between the broker and the salesperson. So n the broker's not keeping 100%, nor is the salesperson keeping 100%. Um, the next thing I want to state is about the credit report. Um, it's against the law if I get a credit report of an applicant for me to give them directly the credit report. What I'm required to do is to give them the name of the uh, credit reporting agency that gave the report. And I must state that there's some discrepancies, but the applicant must ask and call the credit agency that I give them the name and address and, and get the report directly. So uh, that's put in place because uh, they don't want to have any abuse. The state did not want to have any abuse of people having credit reports, um, you know, distributed out. Um, New York City is uh, a multifamily rental rather than owning homes. In addition, it has, the last time that New York City did a housing and vacancy survey, by the way, was in 1965. So things have changed drastically and, and legislation is being based today upon things that, was, that have not changed for, for 30, 40, 50 years, and it's unfair. Um, the other thing that I, I want to make clear, I am a real estate broker, and I'm also an owner. Most of the, most of the people out here are small owners. They don't own the big, gigantic buildings. They own units, buildings of 10 family, 15 family, and they're definitely negatively impacted upon their ability to make money. Now, we're not talking about them becoming rich off of one building. We're talking about the fact that most of them have to take a job in order to support their families, even though they own two or three buildings. The real estate taxes in New York City are sky high. Water has more than quadrupled, and it's impossible, it's impossible for uh, 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 an owner of a small building, because we're talking about brokers that, that don't, because the big buildings don't hire the brokers that you see out here. They don't hire the agents that you see out here, because they have their own in-house. So these are all small brokers and, and sales, no, 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 no. No, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you, Please, with all due respect to the panel and to the council members listening, I'm going to ask you that instead of clapping, to raise your hand and go like this when you agree. And if you don't, then you can go like that. But please, don't clap and with all due respect. I'm sorry, uh, our Chair Carnegie, but I just wanted to, to, to add that in. Um, we're here as constituents. We're here as MWBEs. We're here as small businesses. We're here as micro small businesses. We're here as individuals fighting for, to stay alive, and we too are your constituents. Now, the, I am served in this hallowed halls for 12 years as a city council person. My community knew that my grandfather owned real estate, that my father, his brothers, and I own real estate in Harlem. And the people of Harlem were not afraid to elect me because they felt that I would be able to bring uh, a consciousness because something has to, taxes, we pay taxes, and that's what pays for social services that we need, because we need social services. But somebody's gotta pay for it because the government is not going to underwrite it. So these are all taxpayers that work hard for, for what they do. And they, they're not, there's no big amount of money uh, that they're getting is just very, very difficult. Now, I want to say one other thing. Fees that are usually negotiable. They're market-driven, and they're split. The next thing is if there's a question about abuse, because these people paid to take a test, 
they had to pass a state test in order to become rental agents, salespersons, and brokers. And once they got their license to do so, if there's any complaint that anybody has, they can always call the Department of State and have their license pulled. And so we've got to be cognizant of it. Uh, yes, I was a part of the legislation that we voted on uh, in Albany, and some of it I felt was, was fair and overdue, long overdue. I also felt some of it was not very fair. And that's because I know, I came from a Harlem where I was a child of the 60s and 70s, where I walked through uh, streets with vacant lots and, and buildings that were burnt down. That's what I grew up with. I now can walk through streets where there are people inhabiting housing and that, they, that there's now good and, and viable, good quality housing in the community in which we can now be proud of. We, the, when I was a kid, you could hardly find a store to go buy good groceries. You had to go to Jersey to do that. I don't have to do that anymore. I can buy in my own community, and the dollar circulates to make the foundation, the economic foundation of my community rise up instead of being depressed. The next thing I want to state is I don't know if it's constitutional to, to uh, please, please, please. I don't know if it's constitutional for a, a government entity to determine how much a person can make. Now, the banks nearly took this country down. Nobody determined what they could charge. We're not determining how much in any other industry. We're just focusing and targeting and hitting the real estate uh, uh, industry, where so many people, they're small, most of them are small, because like I said, the big boys ha have their own in-house. So none of them get a dollar from large buildings. And so we, we have to take into consideration when we're making legislation that we should talk when I was in the city council and even in the, in, in the assembly, I talk to both sides. I hear both sides. I don't talk to the big boys because I know they're going to tell me something different. But I talk to my small uh, 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 brokers. I talk to the small owners. I talk to, the, to, to those that are really working in the community. And those are the buildings that are small buildings. They're not big buildings. They're not making a lot of money. And in fact, I, I grew up where they walked away from them or they sold the buildings to someone who then turned it into a condo where I was moved out anyway and I couldn't rent there anyway. So I, I fight that all the time and I stood up because I, I'm sensitive. I came from a family, we live in our own buildings. Oh, my sister lives in one of our buildings. We're not afraid to live in our own buildings where we're renting. We're there. We're in-house. We don't live in Jersey or Westchester or out in Long Island. We live in Harlem in buildings that we own. We've been there for 50 or 60 years in, in some cases. So this is not something that uh, uh, Chair Cornegay that is, is not close to my heart. I'm fearful about what's, what's, what this city is turning into because what's going to happen is that the, the minority communities are going to be adversely affected and below 96th Street, they never had any difficulty like we did in the 60s and 70s north of 96th Street. Now, you can talk about it, but that's, that, that's, the, that, that, that's the line. That's the line in Manhattan anyway. I don't know what the line is in Queens, but in Manhattan, that's the line. And I know for a fact, I lived it. No one has to tell me that below 96th Street, they did not suffer in their housing stock the way we did above 96th Street. Now, in addition to, to the rental security deposits and, and the other fees charged, the credit fee now, because of the new legislation in the state, is mandated down to $20. The average credit report runs about $50 to $75. And it's used as, as a tool such as 
any other application, when you apply for a credit card, when you apply for, for a bank loan, even when you apply for a, uh, a, another bank, another loan other than a bank, a credit report is obtained. When you apply for many jobs, credit reports are obtained. Background checks are done because you've got other families living in your building and you don't want anybody coming into the building that's selling drugs, that has a history of doing anything negative. You, the owner is responsible to see to it that that doesn't happen. If we're not allowed to do background checks and credit checks, then trust me, then you're opening the doors and of, of, of allowing uh, anyone to come in on the property that I, ha I had a building. I have a building right now where a family lived, with, lived in the building. And another, another tenant who should have never been admitted killed the woman, the mother, and threw her body out the window. So I know what happens when you can have a negative tenant. We try to avoid renting to, to certain elements because we know what can happen. And that's, th those are not excessive fees that we're putting in our pocket. These are fees that we have to pay out in order to see, get the background check, to get the credit check, in order to try. And everything's not on paper, because sometimes, you know, sometimes you can meet a person you, and it's perfect, but your gut feeling tells you that something is not right. And so that's the purpose of that. Now, the, the security deposits in, in apartments generally for apartments, not condos or co-ops, but generally in rentals is, is one month's rent. Now that's generally the, the, the thing. The market sets it and rent stabilization, which most of these units are under, also ha has a statement on it. So it's a one month deposit that's held and the purpose of the holding of it and you generally don't get a thing, it doesn't help you at all, is at the end of the, of the lease, usually the tenants want to live out that, that, that security deposit. So you don't get a chance to use it anyway because they're living on it. They don't pay any rent the last month that they're there and that's not to be negative about any tenant because the tenants have lifted me up over the years in my community. So, but, but the truth of the matter is frequently, they, I, when I rented when I was in college, I lived out my last month rent and I wasn't supposed to. But that, that's what I did. And, well, uh, and uh, Assembly member, I, I wanna say to you that what you've done today is offered a very interesting perspective from a state legislator perspective to actually uh, a business owner and landlord and renter. Um, I think that there are those unique voices and perspectives that we anticipate hearing for, for the rest of the session. Um, uh, we are unfortunately on a time constraint um, and we have in front of me at least 10 panels and a I, thousand. I and apologize, a, and a thousand. I, I apologize. Listen, I hope this doesn't come off of me rushing you because I need your friendship going forward <laughs> and I, I, know be, I know better than that. I was trying to, <laughs> trying to subtly say that we, we do want to hear from as many people as we possibly can. But what you've offered me as a, as a state representative, I can't imagine what your negotiations were like having this passion for this during that legislative process. And I respect and appreciate what you must have had to go through with your colleagues. Thank you, because Chair, I am passionate that I want quality, viable housing available to my community that is affordable. And the reason, I don't want vacancies, because then I can't pay the real estate taxes and the city gonna take the property in one year. So I don't want a vacancy. Now these big guys and NYCHA that has not taking care of its property here in the New York City, they, 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 that's something different. But I don't want the violations. I don't want to get a, a notice a, a delinquency about my real estate taxes and my water bills. I don't want that. I want my property viable and, and great and, and, and want people to want to live in my buildings. And that's what most of these people do. Is that, not, just raise your hand, don't just say a word. So I, I thank you for giving me this time. I know I may have overstepped my bounds, and I apologize to, to you for that. I know all of the members up there, 
except, uh, of course, Council Member Powers. I'm, I'm meeting, I haven't met him yet, but I'm seeing him really for the first time. Uh, but, but the rest of the council members I served with, including you, and, and I trust that during my time here that I was fair to the city of New York, to all residents, to renters, and to brokers, and to anyone else, because we're all your constituents. We all want to pay taxes. We all want to be part of that middle class that everybody talks about. And, and sometimes legislation is put in that prevents that. And so today, I wanted to just come and talk about it and, and, and join in with my colleagues who are so adversely affected. And thank you. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. We love to have you in this chamber. Um, I, one perspective I do want to think about is the idea that you're saying that there's a potential for background checks not to be done as thoroughly based on the discrepancy between what is the, 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 the ceiling mm -hmm. and what the actual cost of that is. That's something that we should think of as a yes. council. Yes. Um, because obviously no one wants that. We, we need to have the safest environments for tenants in the city Absolutely. of New York and background checks and need to be done. And there's got to be tenant protection laws in place. There's no doubt about that. Thank you for that perspective. I think that's something we need to look at closely. All right. It's Thank always you. good to see you. Thank you. Good seeing you. Thank you. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. So the uh, next panel we're going to call is uh, Rachel Smith, Gina Golsabel, Elise Golden. If you're here, please move uh, as expeditiously to the panel as you possibly can. Again, really quickly, Elise Golden, Gina Golsobel, Golsobel, and Rachel Smith. If those people are not present, we'll move to the next panel, unfortunately. You downstairs? Okay. As you begin your testimonies, I just ask that you identify yourself clearly for the record, and you can begin when you're ready. Hi. Uh, council members, my, good afternoon. My name is Elise Golden. I'm here testifying on behalf of St. Nick's Alliance in favor of introductions 1423, 1424, 1433, 1431, 1432, and 1499. I work at St. Nick's Alliance as the senior community organizer. St. Nick's Alliance was founded in 1975 by a group of concerned residents as a response to the disinvestment and general decline in neighborhoods of Williamsburg, Greenpoint, and Bushwick in Brooklyn. Our mission is to serve as a catalyst to improve the quality of life for Williamsburg Greenpoint residents by addressing economic, educational, health, housing and social needs, while preserving the vibrant and diverse character of the community. I organize with tenants and community members against displacement for the preservation of affordable housing and for the creation of just housing laws for all tenants. It is clear that this legislation will be beneficial to, for low and moderate income residents of New York, especially in North Brooklyn. Day in and day out, tenants seek assistance in our office because they are unable to find housing that they can afford. They might be living in homeless shelters, in crowded conditions with extended families, or in small buildings, and facing eviction due to lack of tenants' rights. Not only are rents unaffordable, especially in North Brooklyn, but the barrier to move in 
from security deposits to enormous broker's fee is far too high for the vast majority of tenants I work with. I'm asking the city council to support the introductions and to place uh, reasonable limits on broker's fees and security deposits to allow renters six months to pay the deposit and ensure several and ensure the several consumer protections. Countless tenants in North Brooklyn are at risk of displacement or homeless, homelessness, but continue to fight to remain housed and active in their communities. These bills will improve access to housing for millions of renters in New York City, and I urge you to pass the legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am speaking on behalf of Jenna Golsenbull. My name is Jenna Golsenbull, and I am a tenant organizer with the Fifth Avenue Committee. The Fifth Avenue Committee is a community development corporation established in 1978 with the mission to advance economic and social justice in South Brooklyn and throughout New York City by building vibrant, diverse communities where, di where residents have genuine opportunities to achieve their goals as well as the power to shape the community's future. I am presenting on behalf of the Fifth Avenue Committee and Stabilizing New York City in conjunction with Jackie Del Valle, the Stabilizing New York City Coordinator at the Community Development Project of the Urban Justice Center. As everyone knows, New York City is in a housing crisis. Thousands of New Yorkers struggle to make rent as landlords and corporations speculate on pushing tenants out and increasing rents. Every day we hear stories about how far New Yorkers are stretching their dollars and lives to continue to live in their homes. The outrageous housing costs start from the minute the search to find the, an apartment begins. For decades, tenants have had charged excessive amounts of money in the quest to find a home here. These upfront costs, whether it is security of deposits, broker fees, or credit checks, create a significant financial burden, especially for young and low-income renters searching for opportunities. These practices are discriminatory and they must end. Neighborhoods like the one where FAC organizes, which is in Park Slope, Sunset Park, Bay Ridge, and Kingston, have a deep history of of community, resilience, and now gentrification. The tenants I primarily organize are long-term tenants. As they continue to be displaced by predatory tactics, I find myself working more and more with older, low-income tenants, trying to find them new affordable housing due to this displacement. These tenants have been either rent-controlled or rent-stabilized, and I cannot begin to explain the barriers that my tenants face after being displaced. One of the main barriers can be eliminated if the city council passes all five bills. These bills are not just words on paper. These bills represent the livelihood of millions of New Yorkers. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rachel Smith, and I'm a legal intern here on behalf of Mobilization for Justice. Mobilization for Justice envisions a society in which there is equal justice for all. Our mission is to achieve social justice, prioritizing the needs of people who are low income, disenfranchised, or have disabilities. We provide advice and representation to more than 25,000 poor and working New Yorkers each year. Specifically, our housing project annually serves more than 3,200 households, representing a total of 7,328 tenants. We thank you uh, sincerely for holding this, and I'm here to testify in support of intros 1424, 1431 and 1433. I'm sure many of the people in this room have experienced the difficulty of searching for an apartment in New York City. I've lived here for six years and I can honestly say it gets harder every time I try to find a new place. And I'm a law student and someone with experience and I'm looking with, uh, with others and it's still hard time after time. And even when you look at apartment after apartment, desperate to find something that's affordable and habitable, and you're just stuck. And when you do find a suitable apartment, you're faced with yet another roadblock to securing housing, the security deposit. Security deposits pose many obstacles for residential renters. One such obstacle is how to pay a security deposit on a new apartment when the tenant is waiting for the return of a previous security deposit. For many of our poor and working poor clients, this is a serious impediment to securing suitable housing. The vast majority of states specify the amount of time a landlord has to return a security deposit. And now, with the recent passage of the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act, New York State now requires landlords to return security deposits within 14 days of tenants vacating the 
premises. A landlord's failure to return this deposit in that period results in the forfeiture of any right to retain any portion of the deposit. Passing intro 1431 would be consistent with New York State law, and more importantly, it would allow poor and working poor New Yorkers to recover their security deposit soon after their lease ends, money that's often desperately needed to pay the next month's rent or expenses related to moving to a new apartment. A landlord's ability to set the security deposit at any rate is another obstacle for New Yorkers and for our clients in securing housing. Landlords commonly charge anywhere from one month's rent to three months' rent, and I even know someone personally who was charged $8,000 for their security deposit. Um, for individuals on a fixed income or working poor New Yorkers, paying a security deposit in excess of one month's rent, and sometimes even, even one month's rent itself, is infeasible. Patch passing intro 1424 would prevent the arbitrary setting of security deposits and would be in line with the amended New York State law. Intro 1433 would allow renters to pay their security deposits in equal monthly installments as dictated by the length of their tenancy. Tenants are often denied the right to rent housing because he or she does not have the ability to put up first month's rent, oftentimes last month's rent, and the full security deposit at lease signing. This proposed change would ensure poor and working poor New Yorkers are no longer barred from securing an apartment because they may not have the means to supply the entirety of the requ required security deposit up front. This bill is consistent with common sense since there is no bi valid business reason why a landlord would need the renter's security deposit up front if the security deposit is used to compensate the landlord for damage to the apartment at the end of the lease. This installment plan option allows renters to budget for the payment of the security deposit, which the bill requires landlords to inform prospective renters about, something that is incredibly important, as many do not know of passing changes in our laws. We believe the passage of this initiative, along with the proposed outreach in the introduction and the education requirement as well, will help end one of the significant obstacles to securing housing for renters who cannot afford the exorbitant upfront security deposit fees. MFJ strongly supports intros 1424, 1431, and 1433, and commends the Committee on Housing and Buildings for its continuing efforts to improve the rights of renters and tenants. The obstacles posed by security deposits are numerous and have the potential to be rectified with the passions of these introductions. These introductions are essential steps toward keeping New Yorkers housed in New York. Thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. We're going to hear from a couple of my colleagues, but I want to say two things. One is um, please don't feel compelled to read your statements in their entirety in respect for the thousand people who'd like to speak today. Um, and secondly, Ms. Smith, I want to say that um, uh, your citing and <laughs> footnotes in your statement um, uh, made me nervous. It reminded me of graduate school. While I, while I appreciate it, my palms were sweating as I, as I read your citing and footnotes. Good job on that. My editor-in-chief would be very proud to hear that. Yeah, you can tell her she made me incredibly nervous having to read that. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Council Member Powers and then Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and support of legislation before here today. Um, can we talk about you, you? Many of you work with populations that are particularly facing challenges when it comes to housing. And obviously, rent is, and the, the cost of rent is a big part of that. But can you talk to us about, um, we're talking about $10,000, $14,000 at times uh, to move into a new apartment. Can you tell us about the population you're working with particularly? How, much, how many of those folks have the disposable income at hand when, they have to, when they're required to move or, or want to move to of $14,000 or so of total in cost for moving? Um, can you tell us, share any experiences with the population you're talking about in terms of their ability to pay? upfront cost at that amount? So organizations like Mobilization for Justice and Legal Aid all have a cap on the services um, to the community we can serve. And I can say with guaranteed with the experience of the legal services organizations I've worked at that they don't. They're on fixed income. They're living paycheck to paycheck. Um, they even very oftentimes are having trouble recertifying for the um, different subsidies they do have. And no one has that upfront for, from our population. Okay. Um, thank you. And, and how many are rent burdened, meaning they're paying more than 30% of their income or more towards the rent? I, I mean, I can comfortably say the vast majority of our tenants are rent burdened. Um, even tenants that are living in rent-stabilized housing are 
too often run burdened. I appreciate it. And can you tell about, um, tell, tell about the, the discretionary aspect of this? We know that um, from things like source of income discrimination in the past and other things where there's discretion involved in the decision about how much to charge a person. Can you talk to us about um, the challenges your particular population have when there's discretionary decisions related to income or tenant and the challenge to them in terms of finding housing? Sure, I would say uh, if fees are negotiable, our tenants would often have very trouble or a lot of trouble negotiating, uh, especially due to language access. The vast majority of our tenants are monolingual Spanish speakers, are immigrants and are not comfortable navigating the system. And so to be arguing for what a fee might be uh, is, is not something that, that the vast majority would be comfortable with. Um, a lot of our tenants are also elderly um, and, again, are not able to, to really stand up for themselves in that way. Okay. And can you talk about, when we talk about security deposits, for instance, what reasons have property owners given to you, to your individuals about reasons they need to collect two or three times a tenant's monthly rent uh, versus one month's rent, as the new law says? I don't think I've ever heard a reason. Okay. Um, certainly leaving the tenant to... Uh, question or wonder why or, or have difficulty in, in the decision. Um, do you, th you know, I made this point earlier, which is about um, even as we talk, have this conversation that I find that there's just a lack of transparency in terms of a lot of the fees that one has. And it's not, I'm not talking about broker fees again, I'm talking about all in fees that uh, add up to real amounts of people, I think for the population you're talking about. Can you talk to us about those fees and challenges they have them and maybe other suggestions about ways that the council can address transparency in the process for price in the in the rental market I mean I can't again I'm a legal intern so my experience with our population is limited but I can say as someone who's been renting in New York City for an extended period of time I have no idea even having the experience that I've have I ask landlords for clarification on fees and I don't get any they say it's just what it costs it is what it is and that's coming from a background where again I know what my rights are and I still can't get a straight answer Okay, and I just want to ask one follow-up question because you have the personal experience here and you're a law student, I think, right now. Yes. Do you think you and, and similar law students can afford, in addition to your tuition and student loans, uh, the, uh, all these sort of all-in upfront costs? Do you think that, can, that adds into a significant cost burden for so students like yourself? Especially with federal student loans, the cost of admission and what they expect you to take out is set up by the school, and I can tell you what the school allocates to the cost of housing it does not even begin to cover what it is. Um, I have friends who commute two hours because they have to go far out into other boroughs away from where our school is to even find something fit that fits within their means and living in often apartments that are flex because it's the only way to make it affordable. I know tons of people who are stuck living in the dorms because they don't need to pay this money up front. The school just, when the loan comes in, they take it. I personally, as a having moved twice within law school, have spent hours upon hours, I'm comfortably saying like hundreds of hours scouring for an apartment where I can either move in as a roommate and not have to pay any of these other fees. And even then in my current apartment, I had to pay a lease for signing fee that was in excess of $300 for myself personally. Okay. And folks, with respect, I, I think booing a law student who's talking about her challenge is the wrong approach. Uh, thank you for the testimony. Councilmember Carnegie, I uh, just want to give them a quick thanks uh, before you leave. Always appreciation to each of your organizations and gratitude to you for working there. Um, your work on behalf of tenants is uh, priceless, and keeping people in their homes is paramount right now. Um, so I, I just wanted to thank you again for coming today, for testifying, and every day doing the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call the next panel, uh, Thomas Salzano, Elvin Rothman, Jeffrey Zickler, Zicker, I'm sorry, Man Mandy Nemoire, Stefania Cardinal,
think we're missing one person. Uh, again, Stefania, Mandy, Jeffrey. Yes, sir. El Elvin, uh, Thomas Salzano. Joseph Barbasia. Sorry, Joseph, for butchering your name. <laughs> On the record, actually, sorry. So I'll ask that um, before you begin your testimony, you identify yourself for the record. Um, and I will just, as a housekeeping measure, ask that you don't feel compelled to read the entirety of your statement. If there are, if there are some points that you'd like to get across, Please emphasize those uh, in the interest of time and for those who'd like to testify going forward. Although we appreciate your time and your patience in waiting to, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you. You can begin where and when you'd like to. Just identify yourself first. Whoever wants to go first. I'm speaking in opposition to intro 1423. Good afternoon, my name is Joe Barbechia. I am the Executive Vice President of Online Residential, which is a data and leasing platform used by New York City residential real estate agents. Our client base is comprised of 450 real estate companies consisting of more than 12,000 users. We created a petition in opposition to this proposed bill and have collected over 4,500 signatures to date. In accordance to New York State real estate law, a principal can hire a licensed agent for the sale or lease of real property for a fee, commission, or other consideration. The agent's principal can either be the consumer trying to locate a quality apartment or even a residential landlord seeking the expertise of a residential real estate agent. No matter who engages the agent, the process is voluntary, market-driven, and is ultimately a choice the agent adds considerable value to the home search process. This process is particularly transparent and fair because New York State law already mandates use of a disclosure form regarding agency relationships. This form must be signed at the first substantive contact between the parties, clearly defining who the agent represents. Moreover, it is our view that it is not the purview of a governmental body to step into the free marketplace and single out an industry with unreasonable, punitive regulation of private enterprise. So please, please do not chase the windmills of real estate agent commissions because the people you will economically injure is the 56,000 hardworking, industrious, licensed men and women of New York City's real estate community. Thank you. Thank you. I'm ready to go if you guys are. Um, City Council and Chairperson, thank you so much for hosting this public forum. I know we all greatly appreciate it. My name is Jeffrey Zicker. Um, I am a real estate broker with Century 21 Metropolitan here in New York City, and I'm also a landlord and investor in a few other states, although I do not own in New York State. Um, you're going to hear a lot of arguments today from most of my colleagues about the industry, about this bill being anti-capitalist, anti-competitive, and really threatening to the lives of hardworking real estate agents across the city of New York. And while all of those things are going to be true, I want you to focus focus on one other thing. Consider for a moment that the idea that good and noble intentions can have really negative unintended consequences. It's really easy to rally consensus for headline making topics like these in politics. Trust me, I get it. I have an uncle who's a mayor in, back in Nevada and two family members who are city council members in Carson City, Nevada. I get what you do very, very well. What's harder as an elected official is admitting that upon further review, the actions of our good intentions and our good sounding headlines may have much harsher impacts on the totality of the community that we serve than had we just left it alone to begin with. So here's what I mean. Tenants will without a shadow of a doubt absolutely become more vulnerable to lack of disclosure if you vote yes on this bill. In order to save a quick buck, they're not gonna hire tenants agents. They'll go directly to a listing agent where the listing agent cares directly about that transaction, that landlord. They care about closing what's in the immediate future rather than advocating for the long-term standing relationship of the tenant. Whereas now, they have the opportunity to engage a tenant's broker and pay a 15% fee. We hate that fee as well because we only collect 7.5%. We make less than a month's rent on a full 15% fee. 
Once again, my approach here is not to just vote no on this measure and do nothing. I think we all agree that there are issues with the real estate industry in New York. Let's talk about some solutions instead of things that may create some more problems, right? How about we substantially raise the barrier of entry to get a real estate license in the state of New York? There are way too many part-time agents who have no idea what they're doing in this city and state. How about we work to create a unified multiple listing service where we make co-broking the law between both renters and sales agents? We do a massive disservice to the people in the city of New York by not having that. We as agents are renters and we're residents in the city and I know your intentions here are good and the brokerage community wants us to make New York more affordable and better for everybody. We have ideas that will make New York better and I promise you if you work with us instead of against us, we'll help you get there. But I also promise that none of those things will be accomplished by voting yes on this measure. I thank you and I yield my time. Uh, Mr. Zucker, I'm assuming that you have those recommendations written down somewhere. For One thousand percent. I would love to grab coffee with any of you at any time. In, in lieu of coffee, if you could get that list to me sooner. Than I would later. be more than happy to. Not that I wouldn't but have if, coffee. If you want to do you. coffee, too, I'd be more absolutely, than happy absolutely. to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, little yeah, it's right there. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I did not at all expect to get up here and make a statement. I'm super nervous. My mom has called me Norma Ray since I've been a very, very young person. My views, I'll get to it, dear. Um, my views on a lot of things have changed through the years. I completely understand all sides of this, Mr. Powers. I hope you did receive my message that I left you one day. It was long, and it I was received very everybody's passionate. message. To no, be very it's, clear, it was actually a really sad have, message. We've been keeping track, and, and I actually received some of his messages too, <laughs> for, for the record. A um, lot of disparity here. I'm not so sure what these, all of this is about has actually anything to do with our brokerage community. Um, I really am going to keep this very short, but I think it's super important that you actually understand what each and every one of us do every day of our lives. We too are in jeopardy of losing our homes, a lot of other things, okay? I hear about these searches, um, and pardon me, the last woman who spoke, she talked about searching for hundreds of hours. That's what we are here for. We are an advocate for you, and I have no doubt that we can all work together and make someone have a happy home. Depending on what you can afford, this, that, and the other thing, we're all in that same space, okay? So please make this very clear. Um, I know there's something super important that I have to say, uh, and I can't recall, so maybe I will come back to it if I can in a moment, because it's a, just going to be a quick closing. If you guys want to speak, and then I'll come back to it. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for giving us the platform to speak on behalf of the uh, brokerage community. My name is Mandy Nembaware, um, and I'm with Compass. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, as someone that's been working with a lot of rental, rental clients in the past few weeks, it takes about two weeks to find someone an apartment. I was working with a client who had a $1,900 budget and uh, we collected a fee that was $3,420, and it was a co-broke. That means half the fee went to my brokerage, the other fee went to the other brokerage. Then I got my commission from my brokerage, of which I can't really say what my split is, but most of the times um, I would say ballpark figure figure 50% of that is going to the brokerage and I'm getting, let's say if I were to get 50% of that, now we're working with $940. After that $940, I have to pay tax, I have to pay health insurance, mm -hmm. and I have expenses. So I don't know how much, you know, if we were to calculate that over a two week period and the amount of time that we put into it, how much are we making an hour? So anyways, I came to America for the American dream. I'm from Zimbabwe. I have first-hand experience of what happens when the government overreaches. And I am somewhat disappointed because I came to New York City. I am also a tenant, and I know how much goes into this job. So this is a very slippery slope. 
that can result in the dissemination of our free market society. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you so much for this opportunity. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Elvin Reitman. I'm here to speak against intro 1423 for the millions of New Yorkers who have voluntarily participated in a rental transaction and thereby support de facto this status quo. I'm also here for the thousands and thousands of New Yorkers who work in real estate and small landlords, including the many hundreds who are right outside this building being prevented from testifying today, whose pocketbook you are looking to plunder. It is horrible to think that the council is looking to punish the rent, the hardworking rental agents whose median income is around $53,000. By cutting their fees by 50%, you are effectively plunging them below the poverty line in one of the most expensive cities in the world. Agents are renters too. I find it entirely disingenuous for the council people and city government employees to be testifying about one or two cherry-picked horror stories, not to mention asking panelists who are ignorant of the majority of transactions to paint the entire industry as evil when the vast majority of agents are honest, law-abiding, hard-working New Yorkers, a majority of which, as you see, are people of color, women, and members of the LGBTQ community. My parents are proud immigrants, granted asylum in this beautiful city 40 years ago when they ran for their lives from a regressive, oppressive, authoritarian, communist regime. And this legislation is leading us down a path to that hell. The landlords have all the power since they control the supply of housing. If they are forced to participate in all broker's fees, the rents will go up to absorb that cost in the first year and will be baked into the rents for however many years the renter occupies, even after they've paid that fee off, and subsequently more people will be prevented from acquiring housing. We are in an affordability crisis, and I implore you, don't raise the rent. Thank you. I want to thank you all for your testimony. I'm going to now take questions from uh, Council Member Powers. Yes, I'll try to be brief, but I, I did want to ask a few questions. Um, I, to the, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, the last gentleman. Who's, well, first of all, thank you for your testimony. And I know you were nervous, so thank you for that, uh, for, for coming up. Um, actually, I want to start the gentleman here with the- Yes, sir. Jeff, is it? Yes, Jeff, that's nice correct, sir. Um, I, I agree with you. I agree with you that when you have good intentions and you try to legislate something sometimes, you have to consider all impacts and uh -huh. regulations. I, to your point about working with or against, don't think at any point I haven't been willing to listen and, and hear and, and address those concerns. And I particularly wanted to commend you for bringing some solutions that I think help a problem that I think, and, I, and to be respectful to the people that are spoke before you, mm -hmm. I think those are real stories, and I think those are real life sure. experiences. I, agree. I think many of you know that. And I think there are barriers, and I think there are cost barriers here, and I agree that um, uh, working all together that there is there is a benefit and I appreciate I want to just appreciate bringing some solutions because Thank you. I think in every conversation I've had with folks individuals constituents or industry representatives I've said if you want to help me solve a problem I feel mm -hmm. is a problem uh, in a different way and I would I would never say no to that I think that's the responsible thing to do as yes, a legislator thank you and I made that may make me unpopular having legislation on it but I think that's the way to proceed so I want to just uh, appreciate it. on the on the point around um, uh, actually to just to Joe's it right um, around regulation and the, the idea that there should be no regulation here um, you know, obviously I respectfully disagree on some of that, how we get there and what is, is, is different. Um, but industries all across our city and state and our country are regulated. Financial transactions that we do every single day are regulated every single day. So why is this, why would this be any different? Even if you disagree with the solution, why would this be different in terms of ensuring that there is transparency or regulation around a financial tra transaction like the ones we and you and I do every single day? Sure, well I never said that there shouldn't be any regulation. What I said that it's the New York state law already, it's been established that that's gonna be negotiated between an agent and the agent's principal. The principal could be either a consumer or a landlord, doesn't matter. So that's all negotiated already. And as far as transparency and representation in the marketplace, that has also been established with the New York state disclosure laws. The agent has to disclose at first substantive contact who they represent. So these mechanisms are in place already. So if I go online today and I'm looking for an apartment and it's not a no fee, it's a listing that says it, I don't have any, I don't, on the sites I've looked on, I've never seen any information stating here's the fee, here's the cost, 
and it's negotiable. Mm -hmm. and would I be incorrect about that? I'm I, I, yeah, if incorrect. I may, I'm, I'm so sorry. It is incorrect. Um, and, incorrect. And if I may kind of dispel in, in industry um, falsehood that most people see, when you, when you go online and you go into Street Easy and you see something that's listed as no fee, it doesn't mean that there's no fee. I know, I understand. Yeah, I understand that. So, but it's baked into the cost of the rent, right? And so when I when I advise a landlord and I give them two different prices, I give them the sub the sub market price with a tenant paid fee, and then I give them the no fee price, right? And some landlords like to go with the higher price; they like the higher rent rule. Others just want to move it more quickly. Um, I've always been willing to negotiate fees with with clients, and I know that most of my colleagues would say the same thing. There are some individual firms that have rules that agents cannot negotiate down, but those are the, those individual firms, not individual agents. Um, and I, I think it's kind of a, a dangerous thing to eliminate that negotiating power because part of my power, being an agent where I have a higher split at my firm, is that I can charge a lower fee to move an apartment faster and to beat out my competition who maybe can't. So I, I think it kind of takes away our bargaining power there, and, and I think it's, um, I'm, I'm sorry that some people had that experience, that it wasn't negotiable, well, I, but it I guess, is. I guess my question was more, if I went on Street Easy for mm -hmm. today, this is my reference point. Sure. On, by which I think is, I, if I went there right now, does it, I'm sorry, she's yelling at me. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just using a common one. That's yeah, actually yeah, been yeah, the of one. That actually, in the conversations I've had, many people have cited the increased fees on Street Easy and other sure. sites as a burden. But I don't. I have not seen anything that just that has language around it being negotiable. So most of the time, we will not, because if, for example, if the landlord is not paying a fee, if one of these lovely people in the audience brings a client to me, then the fee has to usually be 15%. We split it. We hate that rate as much as you do, right? Because we only make seven and a half percent of the transaction. Whereas if a client comes direct to me, then I might charge one month, 10%. <clears throat> I can sometimes, I put people on payment plans if they can't afford it right up front. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it is negotiable. Can, can I just ask a follow up question on that? Yes, sir. The attack on this says, first of all, I, and I just want to restate, yes, this sir. language in the bill says very clearly, and I'm, I'm willing to hear the reality versus yep. the language, but it says very clearly take home pay is not, is not uh, affected in any manner. And I added that in to address the concerns. I think some misinformation that was given out about that. But I want to talk about another thing. You talk about co-broking. Yes, sir. In a situation where the landlord is paying their representative and the tenant is paying their hired representative, Correct. don't both land, don't both brokers walk, a home, walk away with more money if they're both making 12% or 15%? Sometimes, but not always. It, but why, it, it why, really why is that not? But why, Sorry, but why, go ahead. But if, but if I negotiated with my, if I hired somebody at the beginning of that, I said, mm -hmm. I like you, you're yep. my broker, yep. I, I'm just moved to New York, I need your help, help me find an apartment. You and I discuss, yep. it's gonna be. Stay gonna, off of Street Easy. <laughs> oh, stay, okay, I'll hire, I'm hiring you guys. Yeah, right. And you I, I wanna hire you, you're helping me, you're putting in the work on my behalf yes, to go find me an apartment. You and I, at the beginning of this transaction, say, here's what this is gonna look like, yes, here's some work goes up, okay. I, you and I discussed a fee. The landlord has their own representative, mm -hmm. right? They hire that person, right. that person's, to me, an agent of the landlord first and foremost, that's the person who their relationship was with. They have a relationship, they come into a financial agreement as well. Correct. Why is that not the fairest transaction involved in a real free market society where you pay who you hire and you get to pick that person? And second, why, and I do believe there are scenarios where all parties might walk away with more money. So tell, tell me why. Sure. So I, for anybody's me, obviously. Yeah, welcome. yeah. Oh, sorry. I don't mean to overstep everybody's bounds. If anybody would like to well, speak, we all have stuff to say. Yeah. So I think for me, in in a free market society, right, um, giving consumers that choice. When I work with a client, there's one of three different situations. We either have a no fee listing in which the owner will pay me for bringing them there. We either have a low fee listing where I bring them direct to Eberhardt Brothers or a management company that will not pay out a commission, like a charge a lower rate, or it's a co-broke. A lot of times, those co-brokes carry much lower print principal monthly rent costs, and they can actually save more money over the life of the lease than they would with an otherwise no-fee apartment. And so to me, when we remove that, w w what I talked about in my speech about how if this bill is passed, you will see a lot less co-broking happening because tenants are going to hear, oh, I can only pay one month. I'm going to go direct to the listing agent. In, in boroughs like Queens and the Bronx and outer parts of Brooklyn where people do not belong to Rebney and they're not beholden to the Rebney Code of Ethics, 
I, I know that there are legal disclosures we have to have, right? But people sub, subside laws every single day. They put them aside and they ignore them. And that's unfortunate. And I, I want to do stuff together to make sure that that doesn't happen. But it will. And there will be lack of disclosure because that agent will be working to close that transaction and not on the behalf of the tenant, all just to save a quick buck for the tenant. Can I just ask one last question? I'm sorry again to the chair because he's here. Um, just, just back to my first question. Why, why in a free market, which I've for everybody yep. say this should be the way, should the consumer not be able, and the landlords individually, be able to hire, choose, and pay their own representatives? Doesn't that seem like the free market? Is you that can. You, you choose, but today I, that's the situation I'm talking about. Was where I don't, I get to hire I, the person that I'm paying is not a person that I've hired myself. I've looked for the apartment, I found the listing, I like the community, I like the neighborhood, I like the building. But at the end of the day, it's the landlord who's put that person in transaction. That to me seems not the free market. It seems yeah, like the, you would like to respond. If, if I may jump in, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts here, so we can't get them confused. Once again, each side could hire a representative. That's, right. up, that's up to Absolutely. them. We, we know that. And, and kind of um, inculcated in your basic theory is that if we limit and restrict a commission to a landlord's agent to one month's rent, that will make the process a lot fairer. That's not what the legislation says. Well, you, it says you, what the rent, it does not say what the broker takes home when they uh, You say think, it's equal to one month's rent. That's what. No, it is. No, that's, it, that's, that's incorrect. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He, he was about to say that the max that the tenant can pay is only one month. However, I have to tell you from experience, and am I incorrect in saying that? No, cor okay. uh, absolutely correct. This is about what the renter's burden and that's the initiation sure. situation should sure. be. Sure, so, but, Not what the take home pay is, and the landlord could pay whatever they want on top. They could pay 15% full on top of that. Mm -hmm. You make more money in that situation. It's unlikely that will happen. Property taxes are up 44% in the last six years. We saw water costs go up exponentially. Fuel costs are up exponentially. And now with a lot of this new legislation we've had come out of Albany this last Friday, we're seeing a city where our cap rates, meaning a capitalization rate, the amount of profit that you earn on a multifamily building, right? I say this as an owner. I, I bought in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina for a reason. Um, All swing states. Well, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so the, the good cap rate in New York City is about 4%. Right? Most other places across the country, you see 8, 9, and 10% capitalization rates. So it's already really hard to talk to owners about why they would want to invest in New York. And now when we see this legislation come down from Albany last Friday that really limits their margins as well, it's hard to get an owner to, to say, oh, we're going to pass a fee on to the tenant and you got to kick me some extra. It's, it's just not the way that our market works in a vacancy, a city with a vacancy rate of 3.2% to answer the earlier question that was not answered. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank You're you guys welcome. for that. Thank, thank you. Thank thank you so much for your testimony. Um, as we transition to the next panel, um, I do want to say that I hope that people are not misinterpreting my um, laid back demeanor on this. As the chair of housing and buildings and the chair of this hearing, it's it, I have a necessity to have a fair and impartial hearing, yes, hearing not driven by the chair. Correct. Right. So while I am passionate about these issues as a, a resident of probably uh, one of the most gentrified areas uh, and increasing housing costs, Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Um, I am passionate about these issues, but I am the chair, and it's important for me to have, you know, a more tempered demeanor as we relate to these things, not to drive the conversation, but to, to listen to a uh, great panel discussion like I've heard here. Sure. So thank you so much for thank your- Thank you, and let's get that cup of coffee. Yeah, definitely, I got, you gotta, you gotta talk. You say, and, and I am always willing to hear more, if you wanna email my office ideas and and other ideas around this, of course, you can do that as well. So I wanna to call to um, the podium now, Ava Farkas, Robert Desir, uh, Thomas Zelinsky, Jody Leader, Jody Ledecker, I apologize. So I got two out of five, so let's try this again. Ava Farkas. Okay. Robert Desir. Thomas Zielinski. Yes. And uh, Jordy Jody Ledecker. Ledecker. <clears throat> Last call for Ms. Ledecker. Oh, oh, sorry. 
So who are we missing? That's only four. Yeah, no, because we only have four. Got it. Okay. So I'd just like you to identify yourself for the record, and you can begin your testimony as soon as you've, uh, as soon as you're ready. Good afternoon. I'm Robert Desir. I'm a staff attorney with the Legal Aid Society. Thank you, Chairperson Carnegie. Thank you, Council Member Powers, for having this hearing and allowing us to testify. This, legal, this testimony is submitted on behalf of the Legal Aid Society. We support the City Council's efforts to protect prospective renters who are at a significant disadvantage when attempting to access housing in New York City's overheated rental market. We are in the midst of an affordability crisis that, are, that is particularly acute for low-income renters, whether it is those leaving substandard housing or those leaving shelter. The lower the vacancy rate, well, the lower the rents, the lower the vacancy rates, the more difficult it is to find an apartment. When tenants who are our clients, who are mostly low-income, are finally able to access housing and identify housing, new pitfalls await them. Due to scarcity, a vacancy attracts legions of prospective tenants vying for the same rental unit. To finalize on an apartment, low-income tenants like our clients sometimes need assistance with things like fees, security deposits, and moving expenses. Many of the fees that we see are inflated and have no rational relation to any real cost. This exploitation of vulnerable populations and of our overheated market just, is just what this body is designed to protect against, particularly as we are in the midst of a housing emergency. So we find particular utility in intro 1423 that would prohibit the collection of any fees that exceed one month's rent, and intro 1433 that would allow a tenant to spread the cost of a security deposit over several months without penalty, which would expedite the lease-up process. These bills will go a long way towards removing some of the barriers they face and increasing accessibility to much needed permanent housing. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Thomas Zelensky. I've been a resident of New York City now for 11 years, currently living up in Harlem. Um, I am here in, in general support of, of something to address what everyone is in the room has spoken today about housing in crisis. Um, just as a little background, um, when I moved to New York City, it was the middle of the economic recession. I had a home back in Michigan that I could not sell because the market had crashed, so I ended up becoming a landlord myself. So when I got to New York and realized that rules sort of don't apply here, because in Michigan, whenever I rented or sold my property, I was responsible for paying the agent who was handling the, the listing for me the fees associated with that. I don't remember what I was pay charged for rental. I don't believe I was paying him one month's rent, but it was a significant amount. Um, but coming to New York, I found that the opposite is true that the burden of broker fees are pushed on to the tenant due to the market dynamics here. I've submitted my testimony. I know there's time. I'm just going to skip towards the end. Um, I'm now in my fourth apartment in 11 years. I've had to downsize continuously as rents have gone up. Each of these moves have cost me thousands and thousands of dollars, both in fees, uh, costs for deposit, first, last, and security. I also found myself in a position of unemployment, caring for an elderly parent with Alzheimer's dementia. So my previous, my current landlord asked me for seven months' rent up front. When I add all that together and the cost of moving, we are well over eighteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year, times that by four different moves you have a sitting of an amount. I don't want to take money out of people's pockets. Um, I worked in the restaurant industry here for many years and worked on tips. Uh, I know that the restaurant workers don't receive a quote living wage up until recently. I think one solution might be to push for a living wage for people in the real estate industry. And that 
commissions or things are more on a bonus system. So the more apartments you rent successfully, then maybe you receive the bulk of your salary or a portion of your salary in bonus, but you still have some form of living wage. I think if we're truly serious about addressing affordability here, I think it's a multi-pronged approach, shifting the responsibility back to the landlords for agent commissions. Preventing landlords from asking no more than the cost of one month rent as a security deposit, ensuring market rate tenants are guaranteed a lease renewal provided there are no arrears or significant issues with the tenant, capping increases to either the cost of inflation or more than 4% per year for renewals, getting rid of the dreaded renter's blacklist, uh, and ensuring landlords are not using such lists to deny leases to otherwise qualified tenants ensuring that renters have the right to a two-year lease extension provided the terms are reasonable, and providing more protections for market rate tenants against aggressive landlords and threats of eviction. Um, my landlord had offered me a renewal this year because of a miscommunication in my response to that. He thought I had said no. He immediately put it on the market. I corrected him to say I did not say I wasn't renewal. He said, it's too late, you're out you have 30 days. So I just spent the equivalent of seven months rent plus moving costs to move in where I'm now because it's a market rate apartment. Even though I'm current, never late, no problems, no issues, he said to me that I don't think our personalities fit really well. And so now I'm forced to be in a position to look again. I think by pushing some of the burdens back onto the landlords, you might think twice about not working with a tenant if you had to face the prospect of paying a broker a month's commission, 12%, 15%, wherever, whatever it is. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Ava Farkas. I'm the executive director of the Met Council on Housing. We're the city's oldest tenant union, and I am here today in support of the, the bills. Um, right now, our city, in our city, it's extremely hard to move and find an affordable rent, and when you add exorbitant broker's fees, the cost to move becomes prohibitive. We know the affordability crisis is especially acute for the 20% of families considered extremely low income, making under $25,000 a year. An affordable rent for them would be under $700 a month. Just to see what's available for low income, uh, families right now. I went on Street Easy this morning. I did a search for no fee apartments in any borough renting for $1,000 and found zero results. There were a whopping three when I included fees. And I only found 12 apartments renting for less than $1,500 without a fee and 120 with a fee. This is the current rental market we're in. It's not a fair market. A colleague of mine, I, I know some organizers who used to be brokers and real estate agents, and asked them what their thoughts were on this. They will be submitting their own testimony, but I wanted to read some of their comments. My friend said, brokers work for the landlord, not for the tenants. Whatever the, the landlord wants, that's what brokers or real estate agents do. Landlords would describe the type of tenant they want and that they would rent to and which they would not. And many times, if not most of the time, landlords would ask agents to not even show apartments to tenants with Section 8 vouchers. There is a lot of discrimination in this business, and even though the agent broker works for the landlord, the tenant is the one paying the agent. That is not fair. Before, it used to be the landlord paying the agents, then it changed to tenants paying, sometimes a one-month fee. When I stopped working as an agent, we were charging up to 15% of the annual rent for this fee. The law shouldn't even be about reducing the fee, it should be about landlords paying it and not the tenants, unquote. Met Council on Housing is here to ask the City Council to pass this package of bills. They are more than fair to brokers who will still make a decent income at tenants' expense when they should ultimately be paid by the landlords they work for. The bill has already been written to only apply to brokers working for landlords. New York State law prohibits merchants from taking unfair advantage of consumers by selling goods or services for an unconscionably excessive price during an abnormal market disruption like a hurricane. We are in a housing emergency and it should be illegal to price gouge tenants with inflated fees.
Good afternoon, my name is Jody Lidecker. I work for Cooper Square Committee. Uh, I'm here to testify in support of the bills, but um, I'm going to tell you about a personal experience that I had. In August 2017, I found an apartment for rent on Craigslist. It was advertised in the no fee section. Um, I came to see the apartment two times. The second time I was told that it was rented, but I could rent the one next to it for a price that seemed very fluid. It didn't seem like a rent stabilized unit because the price was constantly being increased in every conversation. The broker told me the apartments were going for higher prices all the time. And I soon learned this was a bait and switch operation to lure people in. Uh, the brokers assured me there were no fees associated uh, with that rental other than a $100 credit check fee. Uh, but once they had my security deposit in the first month's rent, they switched their tactics and suddenly they invented new fees. Uh, when we objected, they said we couldn't get our money back. And I had thousands of dollars tied up in this process. I needed to move, uh, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do in the face of their screaming, bullying, threats, and lies. Though I didn't know what rights I had, I somehow knew it was wrong for them to try to force me to pay these new fees. The whole experience felt more like a mob shakedown than a simple transaction to rent an apartment. Um, these brokers caused my family extreme stress, but when I moved into that building and talked to my neighbors, I found this was a very common tactic. Uh, my neighbors were working class immigrants of color, and they invented fees for them like key money and super fees and they extorted hundreds and even thousands of dollars from working class immigrants who didn't know their rights and were often afraid to stand up for them when they did. <clears throat> I went to everyone I could think of for help, including HPD, the Brooklyn District Attorney, the Public Advocate, the Department of State Division of Licensing Services. Um, one person said I should just pay the fees and maybe I could get my money back at some other time. Um, to this day, these bad acting brokers are still operating openly and brazenly in Flatbush, where they control a great deal of the rental market. My suggestion is, in addition to these new laws, I encourage you to create a designated agency charged with oversight of all brokers, whether they are registered with the state or not, so that tenants can get help with predatory tactics like uh, the situation I faced and my neighbors faced. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. I'm gonna call the next, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, before you ask your question, um, I just want to, for the record, state that we have been joined by Rafael Espinal. Great, thank you. I will thank you for waiting and thank you for the testimony. Just for the, uh, the gentleman from Legal Aid Society, you're an attorney, is that correct? Yes. A as you read the legislation as it's currently written, does it say anything around capping incomes, uh, take, take home pay for a person in a rental transaction? Um, my reading of the legislation shows that it um, seeks to limit what costs are passed on to the tenant. Um, you know, there could be other arrangements, but it doesn't look like any of that is covered um, in the laws, the five bills. Okay, thank you. And, and just one last question, uh, maybe for the folks from our Met Council, but obviously I think residents too. Um, do you believe that all in costs, everything in, to include security deposits, it can be two or three, or sometimes even more months, usually two or three, um, are prohibitive to mobility and opportunity for residents in New York City? Yeah, I mean, the rent is already too high. Like, the rent is crazy. So if you add to it, you know, another month's rent or, like, two months' rent, that's impossible, and that's impossible for low-income families to pay. And the city's not creating new low-income housing. Like, the low-income housing people have is rent-regulated housing, and as people are displaced because of rezonings and need to find another apartment further away from the center of the city, those fees become a real barrier. Great, thank you. Thank you all for testifying, thanks. Thank you, we're gonna call the next panel, beginning with Andrew Fine, Sheila Levin, David Shlom, Shine Carroll, and Dana Goldman. Again, Dana Goldman, Shine Carroll, 
David Shlom. Yes. Sheila Levin. And Andrew Fine. Ms. Carroll? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, so again, as we've done all afternoon, I ask for you to identify yourself for the record. Before you begin your testimony, you can begin when you're ready. I'm sorry, Sheila Carroll? Sheila Carroll, yeah. Okay. I'm with the Carroll Group. I'm a broker. Um, I've been in business for over 20 years in New York City. I think there's some confusion um, between fees and some of the fees that were cited. Um, in particular, those move-in, move-out fees, processing fees, that has absolutely nothing to do with the brokerage industry itself. This ex ex exists in co-ops and condo apartments only. You do not see this in traditional rental buildings. The landlords do not do this. This is to feed the pot of the co-ops and condos for roof repairs. This feeds the reserve to the buildings. It's set by the board of those buildings, not by us. We hate collecting those. We'd love to see those done away with, but unfortunately, we have absolutely no power to deal with those. As far as the brokerage fees, we don't set fees. Just like the airline industry is not allowed to collude and set fees, we're not either. New York State prohibits us from discussing fees among each other or setting fees. I can charge whatever I want to a client. The client can decide whether to pay me or not. If I decide to pay, charge one month or 15, that's between me and my client, not between me and the city council or between me and the government. Thank you. So I, I know it's getting late in the afternoon and people are tired, but let's please try to stick to what we've prescribed so that everyone can have an opportunity uh, to speak. One more, so. one, one more uh, thing that has happened that, that I think you may not be aware of. There's a new business in town called Insure Rent. They, because the rents are high, and because of what the new movement has done to allow landlords to only collect one month security, they've now asked you to get a guarantor. And there's lovely agency business set up now where they're now charging the tenants over in excess of one month to insure them so they can get an apartment to rent. Do away with that. And keep in mind, for the people talking about Craigslist, shame on you, be smart enough not to go on Craigslist. So many people have been hurt by Craigslist. Put, put in jail the criminals. They are in Brooklyn, they are in Queens, and they do exist in Manhattan, and all of us have come across them, the phony brokers that should be policed and arrested. And this woman is right. They're not when they're caught. Nobody does anything. There are people who sit in apartments on weekends and collect money. They're not brokers. They're tricking people. That's what our industry, that's why we have revenue, that's why we have an organization, so we have a set of rules and conduct in the industry. And we do have value. Thank you. My name is Andrew Fine. I'm a, a agent with Halstead, or associate broker. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, both the chair and Keith Powers, uh, who's been very receptive to the community. Um, we think you're a very good man with some one really poor piece of legislation, and that's number 1423. I read your tweets, I know, I know. I, uh, <laughs> um, I, I would also like to ask uh, the, the council to please hold at least another second or a third hearing because there are hundreds of my colleagues that are on the other side of a fence that were prevented from even getting on the steps to protest number 1423. I have been in this business for the better part of the last 28 years. I'll tell you one thing, I'm worth more than 8.3%. My experience is worth something. I also wanted to say that in an industry where you're 
uh, median income is in the mid five figures. Your institution here has done many, many good things for workers. Many things like a higher minimum wage. Guess what? We have no minimum wage. You have family leave. We don't get family leave. Bereavement leave? Nope. Health care? Nada. So you guys are scapegoating folks that are making 50 grand, paying all their own expenses, and get zero benefits. In addition to that, I just wanted to say that the, on the other piece where you're uh, limiting the amount of security that can be collected, I think you're going to have unintended negative consequences in that you're cutting off opportunity for people that either may not have established credit, they might be moving from London and they have no credit at all. And there's many cases where, where landlords will give an opportunity to a renter that might have slightly subpar credit or below income uh, or uh, that sort of situation where you're now excluding that because that landlord will say no. I just want to know that's been passed already in Albany for what it's worth. It's and unfortunate. I, and, and I will sorry. say, after meeting with many of you, and you know I know each other personally, right. you, should get in, you should get health insurance, you should get paid, paid, uh, paid family, you should get all of the above. You don't. And I, I know, but I think that's actually a different problem, and I would be fully supportive of working with brokers around well, ensuring that you're getting all those sorts of things. I think that's an issue that also needs to be attending to well, for what it's worth. We are independent We're contractors. Independent contractors. That's the law. You don't understand the scope of our business, quite frankly. Greetings and salutations. Uh, thank you, committee, for um, allowing myself and fellow real estate professionals to uh, express our opinions and thoughts about the proposed changes as it returns to rental brokers. My name is David Schlamm, and I am the founder president of City Connections Realty. Uh, we just celebrate our 30th year in, in business. I have approximately 100 agents. And we do sales and rentals, but about 95% of the rental transactions, I represent the landlord, which up until recently was a wonderful thing. Um, there's a lot of stuff said that I, I have in my notes here that I'm not going to repeat, but I think there's, uh, for me personally, I speak as an owner of a brokerage, and I speak for the brokers at my company, and I speak to all the people I know out there, the rental brokers, the managers, the owners, and stuff like that. Um, if this bill were to pass, it would be quite devastating. Um, truthfully, it would drastically lower the uh, income of my agents as well as all the other agents out there. I personally would have to lay off some staff. I would have to cut some services. And if I cut off services, the people who work at these services will be, suffer too. They need, because the owners of the services need to make money too. What I'm trying to say, uh, Councilman Powers, is that it affects much more than just the real estate agents you know, here. It really is a domino effect, without a doubt. Um, we talked about most rental brokers don't make a lot of money. One thing I just want to point out, like it's 92 degrees today, something like that, and there's hundreds of agents right now as we're talking showing fifth floor walk-ups that work with people for weeks, that spend for cabs, that spend for street easy, and I'd say three quarters of them don't do a deal. And, and half of them don't even say thank you or return an email. Or, or do anything. It's a really, truly thankless thing. And th that, that rips my heart out when, when that happens. And it happens too often. And it would be great if we got like an upfront consulting fee, but that's a whole nother issue. Uh, a really, a, another one. Street Easy is the number one way to get, uh, for exclusive agents to get, oh wow, that was quick. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can I get 20 more seconds? Thank you, thank you. Um, Street Easy used to be free, now it's $4.50 per day per ad. I would love if you guys could, you know, roll back their prices and, and, and say, and, and I'm being sarcastic because once again, I'm in the camp. We live, we live in a capitalistic, democratic society. I'm a liberal, I'm a Democrat, I'm a deadhead, everyone knows I am. It's just wrong, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I want to thank the council for giving us this opportunity to voice our concerns. And um, I just want to say, I recognize in every industry there are bad actors, but by and large, real estate agents and brokers, we serve as guardians of the 
industry because we, we facilitate um, uh, the ability of landlords to navigate through what can be a very treacherous process. And basically, by disincentivizing brokers to collect um, their full fee, you're eliminating a safeguard for landlords. And you had mentioned, um, Congressman Powers, you had mentioned- Councilmember. Councilman, I'm yet. sorry, yeah. Councilman Powers. You had referenced the fact, uh, you had asked one of the panelists, why would a landlord seek um, more than one month's security? Well, if after conducting a background search, you determine that someone has a pattern of not paying their bills, you want to take measures to protect yourself. Because while we are contemplating ways that we can protect the interests of tenants, we're not addressing ways that we can subsidize the nearly $500 weekly cab fees for brokers or safeguard a landlord's ability to pay his mortgage in the event the tenant does not pay his rent. So we're here to provide those safeguards for them. But ultimately, I think one of the greatest problems with what you're seeking to do, and I think your intentions are very noble, and I truly respect and admire them. However, seeking to standardize an industry where there are so many variables that come into play is just not practical. Because some people, someone might have spent 10 years to buy a property, and they've already instituted laws that are limiting the amount of um, security they can get. And you're trying to limit the people. The reason people um, don't have to pay broker's fees is when I encounter any prospective renter who doesn't want to pay my fees, as a matter of policy, I always say to them, you know, if you choose not to rent in a condominium or a co-op, you can go to a, to a rental building and you won't have broker's fees because by and large, there are no broker's fees associated with those. So that's an alternative that's made available to them. Our services are discretionary. And more importantly, I believe that one of your main objectives is to address the disparity that exists, the growing disparity in the city. Well, when you limit broker's fees to one month, I deal with a lot of clients whose budget for a rental exceeds 12,000 or 15,000. These are clients who are worth millions of dollars. So in this particular case, you're saying to people who have the ability to spend $100,000 on rent, well, we're gonna protect you and make sure that that broker, who may only be making $50,000 a year, they're only going to be able to charge you one month security and not the 15%. And even though that particular client may be incredibly demanding and we may have um, enlisted a private driver for them, I can tell you, as someone who's been in the industry for over a decade, during the early stages of my career, I lived on a very steady diet of sardines and peanut butter and jelly because that's, those were the sacrifices I had to make in order to be in an industry that has a 95% failure rate after, within the first year. Those people who are able to remain in this industry for five years or six years are able to do so because they are industrious, they are hardworking, they are dedicated, and they are unrelenting in the pursuit of their dreams. And you are now proposing legislation that will already have, that will have very negative connotations, not just for brokers, but for the economy and for those owners. I have a client who just recently said, with all this legislation that has already passed and the, the legislation you're introducing, she is willing to sell her apartment for $400,000 less because she just wants to get out of the city because of the taxes and other factors that are beyond your control at this moment. And you might say, well, okay, fine. So she's willing to forego 400,000. 
But what you're not taking into consideration are the people that she's employed that will no longer be employed because she's moving her business out of the city. So I implore you, I understand that your motives are noble and I respect you for it, but do think about the greater consequences of your actions because you have tremendous power and the way you wield that power will have implications for years to come and it may take many years to reverse it if you don't pause and look at the broader implications of your actions. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Dana Goldman. I work on the Leibowitz team at Douglas Elliman, have worked with Gabe Leibowitz for 14 years. Keith, I believe you guys had a very cordial correspondence recently. With no health insurance or the safety net of guaranteed income, something that every legislator considering passing a bill that impacts our income and ability to support our families has themselves, we built a strong business that st uh, stems strongly from rentals. We've had to endure all sorts of highs and lows in a commission-only field that salary employees will never really understand. Those of us who've made it in the field have bought, clawed, learned, and offered our clients services of great value, be they landlords or clients alike. Here are just a few reasons we're opposed to this flawed piece of, of legislation. Agents earn um, around, on average, $50,000 a year in New York. We are not an industry, as an industry, big earners. Proposing legislation that impacts our livelihood certainly implies that you think we are. And we've always understood the Democratic platform to be about making sure that income brackets are tr fairly treated. Two. The commissions we earn do not only go into our pockets. The company understandably takes a percentage, from many of us it's half, and then there are costs to do our jobs well. Photography, floor plans, marketing, that all comes out of our pockets too. There's the opportunity cost of the time spent on any given listing we're working on, transportation, client expenses. By the time we get our checks, subtract the cost of all the above, not even factoring in the higher rate of taxes we pay as independent contractors, we are not bringing home nearly as much money as you may think. There's your big reason for number one. Three, no consumer is ever forced to pay a broker fee. There are already countless no fee options for consumers who, for instance, have a good income but limited liquidity. These properties tend to be higher rent amounts to absorb the cost of the fees paid to the person showing the unit. Landlords, especially the smaller ones who work incredibly hard to keep their tenants happy and in habitable conditions, can't afford to subsidize these fees unless they raise rents. Lastly, you're proposing an open-ended bill. So now a couple making $250,000 a year renting a $4,500 a month unit will benefit financially while a broker making $50,000 a year will suffer. Similarly, similarly, someone renting a $2,000 a month apartment who normally has to qualify with $80,000 per year plus full benefits is still benefiting from somebody of a lesser income. And what about somebody making a million dollars a year who now gets to the joy of saving $15,000 to put towards a discretionary purchase while the broker representing a big deal that may, not, that may rarely come their way now sees their income significantly sliced? Are those the people that you're trying to help? Because if you pass this legislation, you need to own up to this and not pretend that this is the tenants with financial distress. The broker's loss of income will hurt their families and lives more than the average consumer you're trying to help. Once again, this is not what we believe the Democratic Party stands for, and I ask you to publicly know to who this bill helps directly. I appreciate you listening, and Gabe apologizes he can't be here to echo my word. However, as we don't get paid a dime if we don't work and his family depends on him, he simply can't miss the meetings on his calendar today. There's no paychecks coming if we miss a day. Can you guys on uh, City Council consider this legislation say the same? Did you get paid and get your health care when you canceled the hearing two weeks ago, or did you have to sacrifice them to do something outside of your line of work? Thank you so much for your testimony. You're welcome. Just one other thing, um, uh, Councilman. You had mentioned you like suggestions, and when we met last time, I gave you one. And I am total favor of. I hate brokers who don't do the right thing. I'm on the ethics committee. Um, I think the DOS is weak. I think revenue could be tougher too. I think the bad people should be out of this business. It's unbelievable that some people still in business, like that lady at the end previously who sat here. That's bullshit. That shouldn't happen. That really shouldn't happen. And um, as much as I'd like to have those kind of expl exp expletives, sure. Used, I apologize. Yeah. I apologize. Right. I go to sometimes I meditate. Okay. 
Anyway, uh, you, you um, wouldn't happen to be from Brooklyn by any chance, would you? No, 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 no. Long Island. Right. <laughs> Long Island originally. Um, but um, let, let, us, let us display whether there's a fee or no fee on an ad. That, I think that would certainly be good. I said in my company, we say broker fee applies. Um, yeah, there should be transparency. It shouldn't, we should not allow brokerage firms who do the old thing of no fee, and then the call, person calls up, department doesn't exist, and now they're seeing fee things. So, you know, and the last thing is, as far as OP goes with landlords pay, they either usually pay one month or they pay nothing. And if, in fact, if I try to convince some my landlords to pay a commission, uh, which at times I wish they would, especially in the winter months, but they don't, then if they open up their own leasing office and hire people, they're just going to raise the rents. It's, it's, so you, you're either going to pay for it now or you're going to pay for it later. Thank you. Thank you again for your testimony. We're going to call the, the next panel. Iris Korkos, Reggie Thomas, Douglas Wagner, Sarah Salzberg, Gary Malin, You can identify yourself and begin your testimony when you're ready. Sure. Good. Uh, yep, all good. Uh, good afternoon, Council Member uh, Cornegie, Council Member Powers, and Council Member Perkins. My name is Reggie Thomas, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs of the Real Estate Board of New York. Thank you so much again for allowing us to testify on today's bills. Um, because we only have about a minute and 50 seconds, let me just start off on the things that we agree on. How does that sound? In terms of two specific bills, just to start off with, Interest 1432, which requires transparency and fees. To be clear, the Real Estate Board of New York is 100% for any efforts to increase transparency in the market. It's good for our brokers, it's good for our residents, and it's good for property owners. And to that end, we unequivocally support Intro 1432. In terms of Councilmember Cohen's bill, Intro 49, regarding tenant screening reports, to the extent that the law allows, these tenant screening reports should be provided to the tenant. They paid for it. It's important for them to know what's in it, especially if there are any inaccuracies, they have a right to know what those inaccuracies are. The one provision of the bill we do object to is for a violation to be issued against the individual who collected that fee for the processing of the tenant screening report if, the vacant is in a, if the, there is not actually a vacant unit in that building. The problem is the property owner is the only one who knows whether or not the vacancy is bail, is, is whether there is a vacancy. So as a result, you have a residential real estate agent who might collect a fee to process this, but they have absolutely no idea whether or not the property owner is simply going through the motions or whether or not they actually have the unit available. And so to that end, it's inappropriate to issue a violation against those re real estate agents who are simply trying to do the right thing. In terms of the two bills that were recently passed by the state legislature, intros 1424 and intro 1431, 1431 requires that security deposits be returned within 14 days. The original council bill said 60 days, and that was something that the real estate industry unequivocally supported. Here's the problem with 14 days. Oftentimes, property owners wait for the electricity bill to come in or try to schedule a walkthrough with a tenant, and that takes time. And those are pressures and things that the property owner cannot control. So it's inappropriate to put that pressure on the property owner, who now is going to return that security deposit, be out $1,500. They're going to have to chase after the tenant in order to actually get that money back. And so because of that, this is something that I understand the council is going to approve because the state legislature already adopted it, but it's going to be problematic and you're going to see an uptick in collections for electricity for these very renters we're trying to help. Um, I know, um, I figure if I can maybe get another minute since I'm talking about some of the other bills that we haven't spoken about. But thank you, Chair. Um, intro 1424, in terms of limiting security deposits to one month's rent. Again, this is state law, it's statewide, so I understand the city council is trying to codify it. But before the state law was passed, we actually had worked with the council to try to share ways as to why someone would need more than one month security. 
using additional months security as a way of discrimination is unacceptable and we all have a role in trying to curb that. So to that end, what Revney proposed is disclose why you need to ask for more than one month's rent. Is it because your credit history? Is it because your rental history? Is it because you make 30 grand a year but are trying to get a unit that costs $4,000 a month and you have $2,000 in the bank? If you're gonna do it, disclose it. And unfortunately, because of the state legislature's actions two weeks ago, this is going to end up hurting the renters that we are actually all trying to help. In terms of the six month installment of security deposits, intro 1433, the only other jurisdiction that has approved this so far, major jurisdictions we can tell is Seattle. They approved this only in January. So we only have six months of information to go off of. Every single property owner we have spoken to have said a six month installment of a security deposit is not an actual security deposit. If there is a renter who ends up breaking their lease, damaging their apartment in month three, who's gonna end up paying that, the, the, what's left over? It's either the property owner or the other renters in the building. And for a property that might have only 10 units, 15 units, you better believe it's gonna be the 14 other units in that building who are gonna have increased rents because in order to make up for the the, the unfortunate incident of, a pro of another renter. And to that end, we want to caution, we agree with the city council, we need to make it easier for renters, but this is going to have significant unintended consequences and we would ask to wait a year, see how Seattle goes. If we're wrong, we're wrong, but based on everyone we have spoken to, we believe that this is what the market is gonna end up doing. The last thing, let me just talk about 1423. I won't spend too much time on it because I have some colleagues in the industry here to talk about this, but it's important to maybe just take a step back and kind of talk about sort of the political rhetoric that we've had. And you gotta see, they're all fired up. I mean, we're proud of our members at Rebney. But in the five months that I've been working on this bill since this bill was introduced, every hour in the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, these are the people I speak to. These are everyday New Yorkers. They are diverse. They actually reflect New York City. And I have heard public commentators say all they do is turn a key. I have heard elected officials say the way they earn a living is overbearing or ridiculous, not Councilmember Powers, other, other elected officials. And in terms of sort of their anger, I gotta tell you, they're actually being pretty good right now. This is sort of the anger that they have had over the past five months, the way that their lives have been described. And we have an affordability crisis in the city. And this is the Real Estate Board of New York saying we have an affordability crisis in the city but solving it is not gonna be done on the backs of these individuals who maybe earn $40,000, $50,000 a year. Pay for those taxes, pay for their own health insurance. I gotta say, we have an opportunity here to move forward in a way that's constructive, that implements transparency in the industry. That's something that we all welcome, Revenue welcomes, and we're happy to do so. But again, I wanna again thank the members that are here, but I also wanna take a moment to thank Councilmember Powers. Um, in the five months that this bill has been introduced, we talk to Councilman Powers on a weekly basis, sometimes multiple times a day. He has read every single one of your messages, every single one of your tweets. He's even forwarded me some of your Instagram direct posts. Um, we have a significant policy disagreement here, and that's fine, that's normal, we're in New York City. Um, and of course, people are ginned up about this, but it should be said that, you know, I've worked with elected officials for the past 10 years, and there are only a few that truly read literally every single message, and on a personal and professional uh, appreciation on behalf of the industry, we just wanna thank you for, for hearing everybody out. Thank you. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Sarah Salzberg, and I am um, the co-founder and co-owner of Bohemia Realty Group. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that w when I first moved to New York City in 1998, I was fresh out of Boston University as an acting grad, and I decided to get my real estate license on a whim. And um, here I am 20 years later, and I'm just so proud to be here with all of these community members of, of mine that have taken the day off of work for the second time in two weeks they have, they have said that you know, they, they could make commissions, they're not going to, they're gonna be here, and to all of those people who were not able to get in that were outside of those gates. Um, in 2012, I opened Bohemia Realty Group in Harlem with 18 agents and a mission to improve the quality of life for clients, agents, and our communities. We have a second office in Washington Heights, and right now we have over 170 agents and staff, many of whom have a background in the arts, and almost all of whom service the neighborhoods that they live in. Through real estate, our agents have self-produced records, they've paid off student debt, and they've started families. We are hardworking people who love and have pride in what we do, and we are at the core of who this legislation will impact. 
At Bohemia, a large part of our business is representing owners of mid-sized, multifamily portfolios. And in addition to providing all the services that you would assume go into being an exclusive broker, such as pricing recommendations and marketing units, there are many other ways that we work with both the owner and the tenant before, during, and after the lease start date. So just want to give you some examples of what those things are. Communicating with the owner on issues within the building, from consistent litter to a broken elevator to illegal activity. Advising the owner on services within the building, like storage or a bike room, that would increase quality of tenant life. Advocating for a tenant during a, negotiating, during a negotiation, getting the landlord on board with a tenant who may have less than perfect credit or be under the income threshold but may show financial stability or promise in other ways. Staying on top of a re renovation by bothering contractors and visiting a unit over and over again. If the unit is not completed on time or not completed properly, negotiating fees and concessions for the tenant with the owner. Being a touch point for and at many times advocating for the tenant. Reaching out on the tenant's behalf before eviction proceedings. All of these things to try to communicate better between tenants and landlords. Those of us that have pursued careers in real estate find fulfillment in many ways. But in order to do all of these things that we do effectively, we have to first eat and feed our families. At an average of $50,000 a year, any significant loss of income would effectively mean that rental agents would need to work, look for other means of income, if not new careers entirely. And I think that we can all agree with this legislation that was just passed in Albany. It is absurd to think that a landlord will subsidize broker fees for their exclusive firms. It's just not going to happen. If the proposed legislation capping our commission were to pass, this shift would happen overnight for people that have put years of their life into real estate. And I'm an actor in heart, but I don't think that it is an overstatement to say that I think that that would be a tragedy for both rental agents and for their clients if that were to happen. Thank you to the council and to Mr. Powers for hearing us today. Um, as you consider today's legislation, I think it is important to educate you as policymakers on how the current broker fee model works and how it is beneficial to consumers and how the proposed bills would ultimately cost consumers more in the end. I'd like to walk you through the chart here, uh, which is also in the testimony handout. Uh, under the current brokerage model, a tenant who pays a broker fee compensates that broker once, regardless of whether the broker represents the landlord or the tenant, and regardless of how long they stay in the apartment. If landlords were mandated to compensate the broker they engage to represent them, it is certain that landlords would build that extra cost into the rent, resulting in rents going higher. Let's take a $2,000 monthly rent, for example. Under current market conditions, the typical commission for a $2,000 apartment would be $3,600, or 15% of the first annual rent. If the landlord were required to pay that fee, the $3,600 would be amortized over the first 12 months of the lease at $300 a month, times 12 months equals $3,600, which the landlord would then have to pass back to the tenant in the form of a rent increase. So our $2,000 base rent suddenly becomes $2,300. Now, alternately, if the tenant were to pay that broker fee, which they are frequently able to negotiate to a lower rate, the rent could remain at the lower $2,000 level for the base year and renewals. Many tenants remain in their apartment for three, four, five years, and even though uh, they pay that broker fee just on the first year. At the end of that first year where the landlord pays the fee on that $2,300 rent, the landlord will always base their second year rent increase on $2,300, not the original $2,000 price. So the rent in year two would probably go up to $2,350, in year three maybe $2,400. So while the landlord could recapture the fee they paid their broker in the first year of the lease, they would then change, they would charge the tenant that extra $3,600 again in year two and again in year three. Uh, the bottom line is that when tenants compensate their broker, they save money long term, and when the landlord pays up front, tenants suffer long term. Thank you. I do want to say that generally um, we refrain from using visual aids, although this was very helpful, <laughs> only because it can go bad. So just for the, for the future, everybody don't come in with your homework. And, and, and visual aids, we, ge we generally don't allow it, but this was very helpful. Un unless it's been vetted before for obvious reasons. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, hello, uh, my name is Gary Ballin. I am the president of City Habitats, a residential brokerage firm here in Manhattan. And I think everyone in this room agrees that there's very good intentions in these laws, but there's a lot of practical implications that will occur when you actually have these laws go into reality. And I think there's lots of ways to create uh, a more transparent community, but not on the backs of residential real estate brokers. I'm sitting here, and I'm quite taken by the statement above your heads, which says a government of the people, by the people, for the people, because this legislation is for only certain people, and it's hurting other people dramatically. And I think the fact of the matter is, is that these people work extremely hard. Owners are not gonna pick up these additional expenses. To, to sit here and say that the law as written says it will not impact someone's financial security, you couldn't be more wrong. It's a naive position because I've spent the last 21 years of my life working with thousands of real estate agents and plenty of owners. And these owners and these agents are being scapegoated to protect certain tenants that don't deserve protection because they make millions of dollars a year versus the agents here who do not do that. I think it's important to understand the practical implications of legislation versus simply writing down legislation. You're going to hurt people, single parents, people who've made financial commitments on mortgages, on rent, on student debt. They have tr plenty of expenses that are being incurred. Every expense that we have as real estate brokers increases every year. The real estate agent is required to maintain his or her license. There's no cap on how much fees the these schools want to charge. No matter what they do, every day their expenses go up, and you want to cap income for one small segment of a population. And if you're going to legislate laws, the laws better serve their intended purpose. This law will not serve its intended purpose. People will be hurt. People will lose jobs. These individuals here might have to leave the industry entirely. My company employs tremendous numbers of people. If we can't afford to pay those people who get benefits from us, those people will lose their jobs as well. I think it's short-sighted, it's misguided, and it needs real discussion on how to do things about transparency. And we could talk about that and create something that creates a better situation for tenants without causing these people to lose 45% of their income. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting us uh, speak here. We also had uh, a meeting uh, with uh, Ms. Zilha at their office, and it, it took us an hour and a half to, a little over an hour and a half to get our point across, so two minutes is probably very difficult, but um, I'll try. Um, I do feel that for some reason, our profession does not get the respect that we deserve. Um, I fe we feel that you simply don't know what is it that we really, really, really do, day in and day out starting in the morning and late at night. We don't simply just open doors. We cultivate uh, relationships and provide service 24 seven. My clients call me when their toilet is clogged. <laughs> it's reality. And I have to skip lunch with friends to go unclog their toilet. Um, and because of that hard work, clients that have a wonderful experience with all of us who are holding proudly this license uh, refer their friends to us, and they're willing to pay the 15% because they know that instead of going to Craigslist and check some, uh, some mama papa person who's, who's meeting them in the corner of the street, they need to ask for this license, and they, they go back to all of my friends right here, and they know that we respect it because we do not want to lose it. All they need to do instead of going to, uh, to Craigslist is to, sh to ask people to show their license and take their number. They can research us. We all are on all the sites. We're on our company sites. I have recommendations on Yelp. You can search me. You put my name and you'll find me everywhere. You know I'm not a crook. Now, because we are independent contractors, we do not have very cushioned jobs with benefits. We have no 401k. We have no pension plans. We have no vacation days. We don't have sick days. We don't have insurance. We don't have dental insurance. These are paid by us. We're paying those by collecting the fees, not to mention the, what we pay street easy. Um, I grew up in the Soviet Union. I came here because America opened opportunities for me that I probably wouldn't have anywhere else. Do you mind if I'll continue quickly? Thank you, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief. Um, I can't imagine that a government will, over, will oversee what I'm making, will oversee, will tell me how to earn my living. What happened to the free market? Is there another industry that 
this will happen? Are you going after lawyers? Are we going under hairdressers, after hairdressers? Who is next? Teachers? Um, speaking of, of careers, this is my third career. I lost my job when I was working in Saks Fifth Avenue. I was a makeup artist for 18 years. I lost my job in 2008, and I almost became homeless. But I was able to do jobs that I could maintain paying my rent. So I said, I love real estate. I always loved it. Let me go back. Let me see if I can start this, this new career. So this is my third career. At 57, I'm earning $45,000 last year. I have two kids in college. Two kids in college. Syracuse and Binghamton. They're the future of our country. How am I, I supposed I'm sorry, to pay for that? I, I went to St. John's. I won't hold that against you. St. <laughs> John's offered us a, a big, big offer, but we, my son, it was too close to home. <laughs> but we'll, we'll consider it for law school. Thank you. Take I just advice. Add, I, I'd just like to add one thing, because we keep on talking about Street Easy here. If you went on Street Easy last night and did a no-fee search in Manhattan alone, there were close to 4,600 apartments a tenant could find for no fee. That's Manhattan alone. So to say that tenants can't find apartments without a broker is misguided. Add Queens, add the Bronx, add Brooklyn, you're probably costing close to 10,000 apartments. So when a person chooses to use a broker, they're choosing it because they know the value of the service. Just to say, someone's being forced to use it is actually not accurate whatsoever. I, I, I want to respond to that point. I did, a, I did a similar search. I did the no fee search. In my district, it was roughly 50% of the apartments were fee and fee, no fee. We can have a difference of opinion about whether that's choice or not. I actually view that as, a, a, as being limiting choice for what it's worth. I think you still have an option. I also don't think it's an option that the person's choosing. The person, the renter, is not choosing the service or choosing the apartment and the neighborhood and living there. I think if you asked many of the people whether they would like to pay the fee or not the fee, I think almost unanimously the answer would be zero. I think that's the purpose of my legislation is to say the landlord has put the, not for a tenant hire broker I'm talking about. I'm talking about if I go on, you mentioned Street Easy, 50% of the apartments I read, it's 45 to 50 in different neighborhoods. That is to me actually limiting choice. And that is, we may have a difference of opinion about the choice we aspect do. of it. I just wanted to correct one other thing is um, the idea that this is about millionaires could be further from the truth. And any suggestion that we cap it at a certain amount, I'm obviously would, at the apartment rate or whatever, is certainly well received here. But I've heard that from two folks now. This is about millionaires. It's, in, it's exactly the, the opposite. But um, I wanted to ask uh, Reggie just a few questions on it. Well, first I want to say um, on your comments around the legislation that the state has already passed, yeah. I understand your concerns. I think I'm, I'm, I, reasonably I reasonably agree with some of them. I just think we're limited in terms of our capacity based on the state having already passed pass legislation about 14 days versus 60 days sure. and um, understand it, understand that, and, um, but we'll still look at those in terms of that. Um, to, your, uh, to the point that I've read, as you said, every email, <laughs> um, I, I don't sleep at night, and um, do you, uh, read, if you read the bill today, yep. you're reading the language as it's written, do you believe the language of the bill says that the take-home pay is capped? So, Councilmember, respectfully, I've, I've heard you reference this a couple of times, right? Because yeah, I mean, well, you, just, is but, it, can you do a but, yes or no at the beginning? But, of but here's why I can't answer yes or no. Because, and this is not just with your bill, but this is with countless city council bills. There's a difference between what a bill says in writing versus what it actually does in the market. I didn't want to stop you there. And I so, in terms you. of what the bill says, no, no, no. you are 100 percent the you are 100 percent right in the sense that the bill says that the total in which the commission that could be paid out is not capped. However, what the bill also says, the most you can get from the renter is one month. And there's a difference between that versus what happens in the marketplace, and you just heard that from Gary right now. I, I, I understand that, I'm, and I, 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 agree, I agree, and I said this to the gentleman who testified earlier, I see still sitting up there, <laughs> that uh, I understand that outcomes and intentions can sometimes differ, that's the Absolutely. legislative process. Right. But I want, to, I want to reiterate that you have agreed with that point. And I say that because I do think there have been discussions and advertisements to the contrary to that. And I'm not saying from you, I'm sure. saying in general, and that the intention, reality, and, and intent do differ and do, do take their divergent paths at time. Yeah. But I do want to be, be very clear with that and, um, and say so. On the, um, 
the recognition of bad actors. I've heard a few people reference that and the idea of increasing standards. And I wouldn't, I'm not, I don't want to talk about personal stories that people have raised to me, but there's been a few where it feels like there has been uh, a bad actor involved in the transaction. And how, how many brokers are there in New York City today? Oh, it, it varies by census and Department of State, State data. They go by the greater New York City area of words of, words of 40 to 50,000 in terms of Remini membership. And again, it's one of those things because we have a code of ethics and co broker and things of that nature. There's approximately 10,000, 11,000, I believe, Remini members. Of okay, 10,000, 11,000. So obviously, we all agree there's some actors in there who are, who are, who are better and who are worse Absolutely. than that. Some who work harder, some who work less for their, their clients. And I agreed, I'm sorry, I, I don't think we met before, but I forget the name of the woman on the end, but I think um, I agree that those who have been in the street for a long time are probably some of the better actors because they've, they've worked through this process and they've stayed with it. Um, but I have not heard a proposal I think maybe one today about increasing the standards or about uh, vetting out the bad actors. And if that is a problem that the industry sees as a real problem, I would hope or expect you'd come forward with, it's been five, six months, you come forward with a proposal to address, obviously when we have discussed the issues that I've raised, but you'd come forward with a proposal to address that. And I, you know, at least now I've heard that, but I still haven't seen a proposal. Are there ways you suggest that uh, the industry, even itself, or the uh, a leg a regulatory institution, could address those who are uh, deemed bad actors? At those who are here today have testified and said so. Yeah, uh, Council Member, could I address the? The issue of elevating the bar to get it to get a real estate license is something that we've talked about for a long time, but that's not something that's under the purview of the real estate board. That's really something that's under the Department of State. Uh, I think many people in this room would agree that we would like to see a, a higher level of accountability among our colleagues. Uh, and that could start at licensing, uh, something that we've talked about amongst ourselves and maybe we could work with you on in the coming months would be a tenant's bill of rights, something that very clearly and transparently uh, proposes uh, a series of basic expectations that consumers should and would have and against which people could be held accountable when they violate because this is not something that's ever existed in New York, and I think we all agree that we'd like to offer uh, our consumers that assurance that when they work with one of us as a licensee, that they have a basic expectation of excellence. Yep. Okay, we'll chat, thanks. No. I'm sorry, so thank you so much for your, um, for your testimony. We're gonna move to the next panel, uh, beginning with Philip Johnson. Frank Rizzo, Melissa Gomez, David Lagaz, and uh, Irene Guanil. Sorry, I gave you my. Those are mine, right? I think. What's that? I mean, I, he didn't say anything. I, think I went to high school with him. Have it on hold until he comes back. Hours. Oh, same here. Do you want to? No. I have to do this. Okay. I don't know what he wants to do. I think the chair is just running to the bathroom, but I think you, I'll, I'll, I'll sit in here. I'll, I'll take his position for the time being. Why don't you guys go ahead? Thank you, council member. And thank you, council members, for the opportunity to speak at this hearing. My name is Frank Rizzo, broker owner of Cornerstone Realty and secretary treasurer for the Staten Island Board of Realtors, the largest trade organization on Staten Island. I come here today to discuss with you local laws 1423, 24, 31, 32, 33, and 99. Under the premise of housing affordability, these laws are being written. And while we can all agree on the need for affordable housing and the importance of affordable housing, good laws are not based on headlines or on Twitter likes. 
Creating affordability based on arbitrary cost controls of service providers will be as effective in creating real affordability as in reining council members' salaries and discretionary funds would be in balancing the budget of New York City. Housing prices are based on supply and demand. When there is not enough supply in the market, prices will be pushed higher. Nearly 43% of all available housing units in New York City are rent stabilized or rent controlled, leaving those not fortunate, fortunate enough to have one of those units to have to bid up the available remaining stock. As construction times in New York City are among the highest in the nation, from planning, inspections, and approvals, the root causes of the housing affordability crisis must be addressed. Streamlining the DOB, improving the speed of the approval process does not make great headlines, but creating more inventory and demand uh, to meet the demand will make us great stewards of the city and create efficiency in the marketplace. I don't speak for everyone that speaks before me and afterwards, but I think we all agree on more disclosure for our, for our clients is, is important. And as a realtor, we have a duty to disclose. Landlords on Staten Island, the vast majority are mom and pop owners and investors. These, those who have purchased an investment property to prepare for their retirement or to supplement income to create independence and to pass down generational wealth. In changing the dynamic of how the agent gets compensated, you are adding a cost to the landlord who are already assuming risk in his investment. Last, landlords mitigate their risk by collecting security deposits, and sometimes when tenants are less credit worthy, they take a larger deposit. New York City has some of the highest, uh, the longest times in the nation for eviction rates. Six months or greater is the norm. What will happen when th this risk is passed on to the landlord? Is it gonna make rents cheaper or is it gonna make rents more, uh, or more expensive? The answer is landlords will raise rents. They'll be forced to. The collateral damage is that rents are gonna be driven higher and when mom and pop landlords are already assuming more risk and faced with additional costs of hiring professionals, uh, professional realtors, more likely they're gonna take those, those apartments off market and do it themselves and they may not follow the same ethical standards that re realtors follow. So some owners are gonna even leave the market completely and those who, who, do, who do remain will put the housing stock in fewer hands, and that's, that's of no benefit to anyone. You know, I've been blessed to call real estate a career for the last 15 years, and fortunately today, I don't have to do as many apartment, I don't do apartment rentals like I did when I began my career. And those who are starting out, providing services to people who rent apartments or they're looking for apartments is a way to supplement their income while their real estate business is growing. Our industry is not made of big conglomerates, they're not made up of private equity, they're not multinationals, but they're single mothers who are looking for, create, for flexibility and independence, the millennials starting out of college looking to build a career defined by their own self-determination, they're retirees who are looking for additional opportunities to keep up with the cost of living in New York City, and they're individuals who have not come from wealthy backgrounds but are looking to succeed off the sweat of their own brow. It is those lives and incomes and opportunities that are gonna be diminished. The small property owners who sell because of the cost of regulation, unless we forget the tenants that are gonna ine inevitably end up paying more because the rent becomes even higher. Now we can all agree for, on the need for good and the good intentions of affordable housing in New York City. We can agree on the importance of housing opportunities for every New Yorker. We have an opportunity here to work on it, however, without addressing the root causes of the issue, we are only placing a Band-Aid on the deep incision, and when the smoke settles and the dust clears, we're gonna be right back here discussing the same topic. Good afternoon. My name is David Legaz, and I'm the 2019 Secretary Treasurer for the New York State Association of Realtors. We are a not-for-profit trade organization representing more than 58,000 real estate professionals living and practicing in New York State, including approximately 12,000 within the five boroughs. I am also licensed as a real estate broker practicing in Queens for the last 23 years, and I'm a retired New York City police sergeant who served this great city for 18 years. Intro 1423A fails to account for the impact that such a cap would have on the market quality, for quality real estate brokers as well as rental costs. This cap will lead property owners to reduce payments to brokers, shift away from working with brokers, and increase rents, as Gary uh, illustrated before. Realtors are not responsible for setting rents. The market is. 
NYSAR supports letting market forces work in a way that produces affordable options for all New Yorkers. Any proposed cap would amount to punishing brokers for market forces that have led to a rising rents. To punish realtors for something they have no control over is unjustified. It is disturbing to think that a government body will impose a cap on what a licensed real estate professional can earn from a client. Brokers provide services pursuant to their state-issued license and the laws of supply and demand dictate what the cost of these services are. If the price of using a broker is too high for a renter, they can opt out of using one. If the market for brokers signals that these costs are too high for the market to bear, then the brokers will lower their cost without government intervention. Our members are hardworking professionals, mostly middle class. In fact, the, the gross income of a realtor in New York State is 30,000, less than the revenue members, and that was in 2016. Legislation represents a direct affront to the ability of our members to earn a living and would cause extensive damage to our profession. We understand that many government officials want to address housing affordability problems in New York City. Unfortunately, this legislation simply targets the very individuals that help renters navigate New York City's complex market. This legislation simply infringes on the rights of the licensed, press, of the licensed real estate professionals to earn a living while not achieving its desired goal of lowering the cost for renters. And I thank you for the opportunity. Hi, my name is Melissa Gomez. I'm with the ERA Top Service Realty. I'm a member of the Long Island Board of Realtors, New York State Association of Realtors, fellow SFB alum, and I also, which 80, with, we went the same year, and then St. John's alum as well. Um, I'm based in Queens. I do charge, quite frankly, I do charge one month's rent when it comes to the rental broker fee. Eastern Queens, we work a little bit differently there than um, other areas do. What, the reason why I'm here, though, is because when there's any type of legislation issued by a government body that is controlling what somebody can charge, you have to sit back, and I think anybody in any industry should be looking at this. When I went to get a divorce and I spoke with multiple uh, attorneys, everybody had a different fee, and if I were to choose a specific attorney and go with that attorney, I would have to pay what that attorney was charging. There is no legislation out there that says an attorney should be charging this. Or for example, I pay $1,500 a month for health insurance. Nobody's capping what my doctors are charging or anything like that. You know, when you're looking at anything that's gonna, that's gonna introduce any type of legislation that controls what we're charging, it makes me sit back, up, sit up and say, wait a minute, the government at this point is overreaching. We do have an affordability issue, but there's other things that we have to be looking at. If you're looking at a $1.3 million property in Brooklyn versus a $1.3 million property in Queens, I'm using that as examples because they're high property values. The $1.3 million property in Queens will probably be paying about $14,000 a year in taxes, whereas the one in Brooklyn will probably be paying about $6,000 a year in taxes. There's a huge disparity in property taxes. Whenever you're filing anything with the, Depart with the Department of Buildings or looking to do anything, the cost to do any type of business in the city is astronomical. You know, maybe we should look at options that if somebody is in housing, instead of, get, instead of doing rental vouchers, maybe what we should be doing is turning those housings into condos and allowing them to purchase into it. We have to start working on ways to create, uh, to teach people how to have generational wealth because we are lacking in that department. Instead, we want, it feels like we want to keep people as tenants and keep them in a rat race. And what we really should be doing is educating our children on financials and, if, and people that are in the housing because that goes through generations. Let's create a program where we're actually helping them buy into something for $100,000. They get, you know, and their voucher could go towards it. And if after 10 years they move or whatever, they created something that they can pass on to their family. There has to be other things for affordable housing, but we're not doing it here. And instead of having a New York City tax, why don't we take that away and have a commuter tax? Because everybody, because I hate being penalized for living and working in New York City. It's not fair. You know, what we are constantly just imposing taxes on our residents, and, that's, and that all affects affordability, which is the reason why I'm saying that. Um, but any type of legislation that caps or discusses anything that any free market industry is charging, we should, every, any type of business out there should be looking at this and be concerned, because then the reality is, who's coming next? Thank you. I'll see you at the next high school reunion. There we go. <laughs> I'm Irene Guanil from the Bronx, and I represent the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors. I'm the 2019 treasurer. I appreciate the industry's conversation. I thank you all for your time. The discussion to getting to this level, it looks 
and feels like we should have had more conversations before this, before it got to the level of a bill. Just today, as I'm not in the field, a tenant wants access to an apartment two weeks, rents free. A past landlord called to say the tenant is not paying for the rent. That tenant was placed six years ago. I have to fix that problem. So whatever I got paid will cover the payment for that service. Another tenant yelled at the Bronx Works counselor that I work with, because I work with domestic violence parents, mothers. She wants him to do the inspection, so I offered to pick him up, drive him to the property, as I have done in the past. Another tenant did not have the commission or security. She asked for the monthly payment that you want. I allowed her to do it. I'm still waiting to get paid. Landlords who pay fees will attend those fees, and then it will go back onto the tenants. Transparency in fees, we all want that. Tenant screening, everything has a fee. I'm not charging any more than anyone else or what the fee costs me to pay. And many times, if they come with their own credit report, background checks, and the landlord accepts it, then I don't have to charge that fee. For us to have to think twice about what services we're gonna provide, I would do less rentals and just get out of that market. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Philip Johnson. I don't have any other titles. I'm just a licensed real estate agent. So thank you for letting me speak today. This proposal, if passed, will inhibit working class New Yorkers from earning enough money to pay their rent, their grocery bills, and their childcare costs. I urge you to find a more effective way to lower housing costs in New York, perhaps by building affordable housing or increasing rental subsidies for tenants. As someone who represents landlords from time to time, this misguided bill will measurably damage my financial ability to take care of myself. Although Mr. Powers believes that landlords will just pay me the difference between what I sometimes collect from a tenant, that is not true. So last year, my real estate commissions told $31,000. That's before any of my expenses. So I know that's a pittance compared to your salaries of $148,500 a year that you recently increased from $113,000 just three years ago. But from that $31,000, I'm able to pay my rent for my one room in downtown Manhattan, and I'm able to pay for health insurance and not rely on any government programs. I'm very proud of that. I'm independent. So working on commission means that none of my monthly income is guaranteed. I have to pay out of pocket for health insurance. I don't get vacation days that are paid. I don't get sick days that are paid. And I don't get the luxury of having paternity or maternity leave like many people in New York will have in the future. So. Nevertheless, with this bill, Councilmember Powers and his colleagues will reduce my income below the federal, federal poverty line and even New York City's new minimum wage law. Many of you identify as progressive politicians. I'm a progressive myself. However, you will not solve our affordable housing crisis by placing that burden solely on the backs of working class New Yorkers. So, regulating or capping brokerage commissions is a destructive government overreach and begs the question of what comes next. Will you tell a family-owned corner grocery store how much they can charge for a carton of milk, right? Obviously, if a store is charging too much money, consumers will bring their business elsewhere. Let's be honest, and we, have a, we, agree, we disagree about this, Council Member Powers. As of this morning, about 49% of rental listings listed on StreetEasy were no fee. People have a choice. A tenant this week came to one of my listings directly and paid me a 15% fee. There are many other listings in the neighborhood that he could have chosen to go to, and he still chose my a listing and to pay me the fee. So obviously, unless he's an illogical actor, he sees some value in the listing and in my services. Unless you think, Council Member Powers, that all people who pay these fees are illogical, which I'm quite concerned with that idea, then you're, there's plenty of choice in the market. So, and then as we've seen this month, landlords are under immense pressure to pay for all types of costs already. So in situation one, if the landlord does pay the fee to us, council member powers didn't even choose to engage with that very beautiful postal board about how that will cost tenants more in the long run. In situation two, if they don't pay our fee, you're lowering my income and you're hurting me. In situation one, you hurt tenants because their rents go up. In situation two, you hurt hardworking middle-class New Yorkers because we may get evicted. So when I have my eviction notice, I'll be coming to see you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I just want to know milk prices are regulated by the state, I believe. Well, one example of food, for example, but a box of cereal with respect. Thank you for your testimony. 
We're going to call the next panel, beginning with uh, Jacques Abram, Marcia Clark, Christina Leigh Stevens, Angela Papalaru, and Maurice Owen Michon. Ms. Jalinda Ruth Colgin. Yes, sort of like the lottery. Come on down. <laughs> Hello. I want to thank all of you for your patience in waiting to testify. Your voices are very important to hear. So thank you for your patience again. Thank you for having us. So do we have um, Maurice? Angela? Angelo, I believe. No? Not Angelo? Angelo. I'm sorry. Angelo. It's all right, I'll okay. take it. Uh, Christina Lay Stevens? Yes. Oh, Marissa Clark? Marcia Clark. It's okay. I'm getting tired. <laughs> You're doing a good job. <laughs> uh, uh, Jacques Ambrum? Brian Horrigan. <laughs> Brian is very popular. Okay. So I, I ask that you identify yourself before you begin your testimony, and you can begin when you're ready. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Grace and peace, everyone. Amen. Life is a fight for territory, and once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over, per my mentor, Les Brown. Let me just give you the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Who? I'm the Honorable Jolinda Ruth Kogan, licensed real estate broker with Douglas Elliman Real Estate and a community advocate. I'm a listing agent. Anyone wants a listing? I'm the person to pick. I'm a 63-year-old senior entrepreneur, minority woman, business enterprise owner. I use my God-given gifts, talents, and abilities at the highest level to help people solve their real estate problems so that they can be more, do more, have more, and give more. I primarily work in Harlem, the boogie down Bronx, do or die, Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights, where I was born and raised. I'm a uh, I, I do have to remind you that it is now do or dine. Bed stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but 63 years old was do or die. <laughs> yeah. I'm compensated for my contribution. My stuff is good. What this bill, 1423, is, is government attempting to rob and regulate licensed professionals without probable cause or a government contract. If you cut my income by 45%, you put me and other professionals who work with me, like lawyers, out of business. When? When tenants seek apartments maybe three to five times in their lifetime, they're free to go anywhere. They're free to choose an agent or not. They pay the fee for my expertise, the good stuff. My fee is not three to five times in our lifetime. It is every day in our lifetime. It's my livelihood. If the landlord wants to pass on the fee cost to the tenant, that's their business. You don't chastise Macy's for charging handling fees, do you? Where? You did not do, city council, your due diligence like you were supposed to. I'm, I'm ashamed of you. Okay, and I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Now, city council, I'm not going to leave you just a rebuke. 
I'm going to give you the opportunity. I forgive you. And you can fix it. Fess up to your mess up and trash this cap. Drop the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Harlem is definitely in the house. Yes. <laughs> <Did> you... <laughs> I missed my kids. I can't follow that. And if no, it was proper protocol, I, I would. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Brian Horrigan. I'm the Director of Professional Development for Bond New York. And as the Director of Professional Development, I am one of the first people that new agents meet when they join our firm. And one of the first questions I pose to them is, why are you making a career change and what are your goals in real estate? I always listen cl closely to their answers, which range from an interest in New York architecture and buildings to a sincere desire to simply help folks find their ideal new home and settle into it more easily and efficiently than they otherwise would. These new recruits come from different backgrounds and industries as diverse as our city itself. They are sometimes young people who are new to New York and have big dreams of starting a new life in the Big Apple. Others come to the end of the road in their previous career, but are not yet ready or financially able to retire just yet. I've met actors, school teachers, armed services veterans, stay-at-home moms, social workers, and graduate students. I've seen former attorneys and formerly undocumented first-generation immigrants walk through our doors, all with a shared sense of optimism for the opportunities which their new professional real estate endeavors might afford them. Indeed, when discussing our profession with a colleague at dinner recently, she remarked that ours might be one of the few industries left in New York where the American dream of hard work, discipline, dedication, and service on behalf of your constituency of clients determines your level of success, as opposed to family connections, favors, or fancy degrees from elite universities. I warn new agents that our professional journey is a marathon and not a sprint, and real estate is more of a lifestyle than a job. We work early mornings, late nights, weekends, and holidays without the benefits of a salary, health insurance, or paid vacations. From the office, at home, on our phones, and sometimes from across the country, we do what we need to do to produce the results for our satisfied clients and to build our business. We, should all, we shoulder all of the risks of upfront marketing costs without any guarantee of a successful conclusion or return on our investment. In fact, we often do everything right, but because of circumstances beyond our control, a deal doesn't close or the desired outcome isn't achieved, and our efforts and services go completely uncompensated. Other times, due to challenging market conditions, an inflexible landlord, or perhaps financially unqualified applicants, it's only because of the skill, knowledge, and creative solutions offered by the agent that a deal does close, and our clients recognize their agent's integral role in not just facilitating, but creating a housing opportunity for them which would otherwise not have existed. Unfortunately, if this bill passes, the folks who will be most affected by this legislation will be the quintessential professionals who have put in the time, effort, energy, and dedication to learn their craft and earn consumers' trust over the years. Without financial incentive to grow a sustainable business or support their family, the most talented members of our team will be forced to find other means of employment, and only those who can't get hired elsewhere or refuse to work hard in other pursuits will be left behind. Consumers' choice would suffer, and the elevated level of healthy competition which exists now would disappear. To be unequivocally clear, if this bill passes, public access to helpful, skillful counsel and the professional knowledge of how to access affordable housing opportunities for New York's most vulnerable populations of tenants would be vastly diminished, potentially to the point of a brand new city council created housing crisis. Let's not punish consumers, nor diminish a talented pool of affordable housing real estate professionals by limiting their income. Instead, let's create the most honest, integrity-driven real estate community in the nation right here in New York through education, oversight, regulation, transparency, and disclosure so that the good work that those of us in this room are doing can be acknowledged and rewarded. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Christina Lee Stevens. I'm a proud realtor. I belong to the National Association of Realtors who make sure that we adhere to code of ethics. So we have no intention of being the bad guys. I am also a member of the New York State Association of Realtors. I'm a member of my local association, the immediate past president. When Councilwoman Inez Dickens was speaking, I held back a lot of tears. She spoke on my behalf. So now let me tell you a personal story. Let me walk you through my journey. I am a real estate broker for over 25 years. I came into the industry because I love serving people. I was working in an insurance company and I saw a broker. I did not understand why she was always wearing a green suit and when she walks in, she said today is payday. I've been waiting for six months. 
So she was celebrating that one commission. So I became a realtor. I teach real estate because I have to use that money to pay my bills, the bills that would allow me to be a realtor, or else I would not be able to be a realtor. I do own my own company for over, most likely, 22 years. I used that money to assist in my children's education, and then it became difficult. A couple of years ago, my income was so bad that I had to get another job in the hospital just to pay my real estate office bills, pay my real estate landlord, and also send my son to high school. After that, my husband decided he was not going to seek help for me at all. He was just going to let me stay open in business. My son was sent to college. Unfortunately, he had to come back home. We could not pay his fees. I said to him, go to real estate school. You will do better than me. Go to Manhattan. It might be better. So I was not able to license my son. He had to work for another broker. My son in his first year made $2,000. His second year, he made $600. Now he's depressed. So now we have to find a way to send him back to school. My income last year, $56,000. My expenses, $51,000. Figure my income. My husband, every day I look at him, and he tells me, I don't know how long I will let you stay in real estate. Capping my fees would not be a good thing. For me, I do not charge what you talk about. That's history to me. No landlord have ever paid me. I struggle to find listings. When I do meet my clients, I disclose. They're fully aware of what's coming. Now, when I'm lucky, I work for the city. The city will give me 15%. Now, that's a great day in my office because we don't know when it's going to come again. Thank you for your time. I know that your, inch, your concerns are good but you should have really consented with the little people in the boogie down Bronx, the small, small real estate broker suffering like I am. Thank you. But see, he missed that. He went to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair um, Cornegay and City Council members. My name is Marcia Clark, a proud member of the Brooklyn Board of Realtors and New York State Association of Realtors practicing in Brooklyn since 1984, and as a real estate broker since 1990. Reminder that the term realtor is a registered trademark, not a generic catch-all moniker. It identifies real estate professionals who subscribe to a strict code of ethics as a member of the National Association of Realtors. Regarding proposed introduction number 1423A, this legislation's goal is lowering rental costs in New York City. I understand that government officials want to address the housing affordability problems here, and we should all be actively engaged in that aim. However, this legislation targets the very individuals that help navigate the complexity of our housing market. In general, the laws of supply and demand dictate the costs of services. Caps on fees are misguided and counterproductive, as it may have licensed professionals reconsider their business model, which may impact the very applicants that are most in need of our assistance. Realize that agents are not salaried, expenses are fixed, and home sale commissions are a windfall when they do come. So rentals keep most licensed professionals afloat. Many of our residents choose to use services of, real, of a real estate professional in their search for rental housing. Due to multiple jobs, limited time and resources, inconvenient living situations, and juggling family life, our, our assistance in their life is the third leg on their stool. Having had an office in East Flatbush and now in Flatbush, where uh, those communities have gone a lot, uh, uh, gone through a lot of recent change. Residential parcels have sprouted multifamily residences, and their former occupants cannot afford to live in many units that are now there. Typically, new building developers and owners offer no fee incentives to attract and fill those units, and/or have their own staff to oversee this process. 
Therefore, traditional real estate professionals are not needed. In co-op and condo buildings, these services are performed by salaried staff with their sheaf of forms, rules, and fees, so we are not needed there either. Many tenant applicants that call or come into my Flatbush office have a myriad of city assistance programs which already provided, provides incentives for brokers to assist them and in turn owners to consider them. This bill would run contrary to that aim of finding housing in an already impossible envi environment. On behalf of the hundreds of thousands of real estate professionals throughout New York State, thank you for the opportunity to be heard today. Good afternoon, City Council members, and thank you for giving your time this afternoon and allowing us to speak. My name is Angelo Papillardo, and I'm here as the president-elect of the Staten Island Board of Realtors, the, a licensed real estate broker of a small real estate brokerage who primarily operates in Staten Island. Representing both property owners, purchasers, landlords, and tenants, I've had a license for over 18 years and advocate for all of them as well as myself. I sit on the Ethics and Professional Standards Committee in our organization and, a number, and have had a number of years uh, and am fully behind supporting ethics and transparency. I would like to thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to speak and, uh, and generally against the proposed bills 1423, 1424, 1431, 1433, and 1499. First, I would like, like to speak about 1423. Capping commissions is an assault on a free market and the ability to earn a living in real estate. As all other expenses continue to rise in this city, putting a cap on what I and any other license holder can earn without capping the expenses that regularly impact running a business in New York City seems counterintuitive. If my expenses continue to rise, I may have to increase my fee. I've helped a number of tenants and landlords. Plenty of times, both landlords and tenants have successfully negotiated the fee without any such law in effect. Next, the enforcement of said bills under 1423. In my experience, HPD is barely equipped to handle the, their current obligations. The language in the bill requires no elements to establish a violation and who, is, who carries the burden of proof. It does not give an impartial procedure, procedure to accurately determine whether someone is at fault. I've also had the pleasure of dealing with Oath as an advocate. There are no rules of evidence and unfortunately, usually guilty until proven innocent is, is the running rule. Secondly, as any independent counsel, as in any independent counsel or legal team, or has any legal independent counsel or legal team addressed the investigation or investigated the constitutionality of the mandating these bills. Such limitations imposed in these bills would, would be considered antitrust and unconstitutional if, if discussed by any other organization. Under 1424, security deposits. Limitations on securities on security deposits will adversely affect those who may not meet the some, some credit or income standards that landlords set. I have seen tenants with lower credit scores secure housing by means of putting more money down as security, which convinces a landlord okay. to accept said tenant. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your, uh, for your testimony. We're gonna call the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Starting with Gus Waite, Jeffrey Medford, Nancy Elton, uh, Robert Brakes, Let me just call those names again. Robert Brakes, it looks like, or Brooks. Nancy Elton. Jeffrey Medford. Gus Waite. Okay, okay Jeff. This looks like uh, Madden Richin Richinson. Last name Richardson. Thomas Salzano. Thomas Salzano. Tasha Trice. One more. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Will Shabbat, Steve Marilsina. Thank you, I just asked you to identify yourself before you begin your testimony and you can begin when you're ready. Do I press this? Oh, I'm on already. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good evening. Everyone. <laughs> yeah. That was actually fair, as, as bad as I butchered some of your names. That was fair. My name is Tasha Trice, and um, I am a licensed real estate salesperson here in New York City. And I have been licensed for the last 12 years. Um, I'm here in opposition of uh, intro 1423A. As a single mother who is currently raising a uh, young man who I'm putting through college, um, born and raised in Harlem, who according to the world, being born to a black mother, black single mother, would be considered a statistic according to society. Um, with the salary that I earn um, from real estate, I actually am putting my son through college. He attends Johnson and Wales University in Rhode Island. Um, I've had to actually pull him out of school on a number of occasions because I wasn't able to actually make ends meet. Um, I say to the council members and the committee, if you decide to place a cap, and I understand that um, Councilman Powers states that it's not a cap. If you put the onus on the landlords to care for our commissions, that will not only um, hinder women like myself uh, from caring for her, her family and children, um, it will potentially um, push other young men of color into situations where they will be statistics because they don't have parents who can afford to help them with this. And I'm sure that you don't want to have uh, these young men and or women running um, through these streets uh, from a lawless uh, state. I'll, I'll, I'll finish up very quickly. Um, the average, uh, a tenant must earn 40 times the monthly rent in order to afford an apartment here in New York City. So with, let's just use the example of $2,000 a month. 40 times the rent, a tenant has to earn 80 times the rent uh, in order to uh, afford an apartment here in New York City. Now with the average real estate commissions being, I mean, the ra average real estate salary being between 50 and let's just say $65,000 a year, my, my, ten my clients earn more money than I do. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, they also have more money in the bank than I do. I also understand that this is a choice that I've made, but this is my third career as someone else has, said, has stated. Um, I'm a woman of a certain age, so this is my third career. Um, the caps are not a good, it's, it's not a good fit. And as the woman, as the, Ms. Jolinda said, you guys did not do your due diligence. You just basically just, you know, took a few complaints, you ran with the ball because you wanted to satisfy, and this is with all due respect, you wanted to make someone happy. Well, by signing off on this bill, not only will you make those people happy, but I'm gonna end up with the Legal Aid Society of the, of the woman who said that she's fights, she fights for homelessness. Now, if we're here to um, help and to uh, fix the homeless problem. If you put a cap on our commissions, then you will be adding to that. We will all potentially become homeless and you'll have another issue on your hands. So I thank you for your time and um, humbly ask that you reconsider this. I thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hi, Hi my name is uh, Colin Medford. You can't hear? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Thanks, guys. All right. I'm here with uh, Citywide Apartments. Um, I'm going to be speaking on behalf of my boss, who was not able to get in today. Um, a lot of what has been said that a lot has, has already been touched on, uh, kind of the points that I want to make. So 
It's been a long day. I'll try to make this brief, all right? All right, my name is Michael Jacobs, the founder and owner of a boutique brokerage with approximately 20 agents. I've spent 15 years building citywide apartments. My brokerage will potentially go out of business if Bill 1423 is passed. Needless to say, this will have a massive negative impact on my life and those of all the agents that work with me. I was very lucky enough to have a chance to speak with Austin Branford earlier this week. Based on my conversation with him, the stated goal that the Bill 1423 is attempting to achieve is to lower upfront cost for renters in New York City. While on the face this seems like a noble cause, in reality this bill will do little to affect upfront cost for those who are most in need of assistance. Rather, the results will more likely be that a small percentage of potential renters will benefit from reduced upfront cost, while many more will be forced to deal with all the unintended adverse consequences of this bill. The overwhelming majority of those who pay broker fees need and want the services uh, that a broker provides and are happy to pay the resulting fees. For all the renters who do seek out a broker and need their assistance in locating an apartment, the following four bad things will happen if this bill is passed. One, the level of service, time and effort and energy a broker can devote to any single client will drop dramatically. Rents will go up if brokers are unable to change, to ch un unable to charge market rate fees on apartments Landlords will be able to rent these units more easily and will receive multiple applications for apartments, which will 100% drive rents up. Unethical business practices will increase. Rental agents will have a much larger incentives to do side deals with clients who are willing to pay higher fees, which will both hurt the brokerage they work for and all prospective renters. Um, and then finally, Top performers and best in class will seek alternative means of employment. Those who are best at helping clients find apartments that meet all their criteria regarding price, size, location, etc., and those that charge the highest fees. If a top performer cannot charge market rate fees, they will leave the industry, which will negatively impact the level of service to renters. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Nancy Elton. I am a licensed real estate salesperson. I work with Anchor Associates, and I'm gonna try and speak quickly. Bear with me, I'm like a lot of people here today that didn't intend to speak, but was very inspired and feel very passionate about the topic and felt that I needed to communicate with you. Um, and I appreciate the, the um, uh, intentions, and I appreciate the level of, of real honest listening that we've received today, so thank you for that. Um, one of the things that, that I want to start out by saying is that I don't think there's a single person that has been here today that doesn't believe that people are entitled to affordable housing. Um, we think it's a problem. It's an issue. Um, we, we don't think anyone um, you know, should have to be homeless. We don't think anyone should have to be taken advantage of by, by a real estate agent or management company or anyone else. We believe in doing good, excellent work for our clients. Um, a question was asked by the chairman earlier that I was found interesting. You were asking about um, 30, you know, if um, people were the, the rent, the phrase that you used was rent burdened, um, where they had to pay over 30% of their income in rent. If that is a threshold, we are rent burdened. We, we are New York City uh, residents. We pay taxes. We contribute to New York City commerce. Um, we too are tenants, and I can tell you that I will lose my rent-stabilized apartment um, if should this go through, because I will not be able to pay the rent. Um, so 
It's unfortunate. I do believe that there's been insufficient education on uh, the issue. We would like to help you. We are happy to educate you. Any of us, I'm sure, would welcome you to speak with us, come to our brokerage firms, meet with our brokers, um, because I don't think you're aware of, of the process, of the dedication, of the knowledge, and the continuing education that we go through to provide excellent service and value. With all due respect, um, this legislation is rife with unintended consequences. You are targeting the wrong entities. Um, it has a an uninfected, unintended effect on our finances, our tax um, uh, income to the city, and um, I certainly hope that this isn't being used as soundbite legislation um, to create optics with voters. If, if true results are desired, then we need to have a different approach, and we want to help you with this. Um, we are not the 1% of 1% that you see on TV. We are entrepreneurs. We are all managing our own businesses. Um, our income is 100% commission. Uh, we have no guarantee of income. I'm sure many of us have worked for two days to two weeks with clients that have not transpired into anything. Um, there, regardless of the amount of work, no sick days, no family leave, no health insurance. I'm right now paying close to $1,200 a month in insurance because I need a hip replacement. My hip has been broken for three years. I've been walking on it. And with insurance challenges, not your problem, not ours here today, um, but there are all sorts of issues with that. And I have to pay that to be able to get to the hospital and doctors that I need, but I also haven't been able to get it done because my ability to work and income is reduced because of my injury, and at the same time, I can't bank enough money that will allow me to take the four to eight weeks off of recovery time needed because I won't be able to work during that period of time. Um, real estate is the most democratic profession that this city offers. All right, people of any background, any level of education, pardon the passion, sorry, any country of origin, any age, any sexual orientation can with hard work come and be successful in real estate. Why limit the opportunities for people to come in and pull themselves up by their bootstraps and have an opportunity from day one to come in with hard work and determination to earn a living and be a contributing taxpayer to this city. Um, Council Member Powers, I think it's been raised, the, the uh, ridiculous fees that you mentioned in terms of move-in fees and move-out fees and, and application fees and everything else, those relate to co-ops. And we, we have said, I believe Jeff mentioned as well, those fees, and those are mostly what you see on Street Easy. They're either directly from landlords and large management companies or they're co-ops and condos. So that particular search engine that you're looking at has a high concentration of that. That's why you're seeing it. And all of those fees are determined by the co-ops themselves and the managing agents. Those are the people that I really encourage you to look at and to see where that can be regulated because a lot of the managing agent fees and co-op fees uh, we can't even fully explain to our clients they don't make sense so we would we would welcome your investigation into those fees um, uh, in terms of affordable housing, we do need affordable housing. We also need to re redefine what that is, where affordable studios in some of these 421 um, buildings aren't $3,000 studios. That's not helping your people either. We want to see affordable housing in this city where people of low income or people that are hardworking, people who work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I'm emailing people at 11.30 last night, have the ability to earn a living wage. I really was jealous of the people that earned $15 an hour when that increase oh. went through because there have been many times where I haven't earned that. I've had to live on $1.99 eggs from Walgreens and 19 cent bananas from Trader Joe's. Oh. Um, also, I came to this industry after a successful career in corporate America. I worked as a human resources executive for investment banks, but after the 2008 crisis uh, when there were some, many layoffs, and I was one of those people that was help, you know, an agent of the layoffs, laying off people, not something that I was proud of, but that was my job to do. I did it with integrity, which was the only way that I felt that I could do it. But I am, was a woman well over 40 at the time, and with tremendous um, uh, uh, skill, I was not able to get a job at half my previous salary because no one would hire me. They didn't believe that I would welcome the opportunity to have a job at a lower salary, and people do not 
hire even human resources is the worst offender, and we all know that regardless of it being illegal, there's tremendous age discrimination. And human resources is just like everyone else, and I was not able to get a job in my chosen profession. So real estate found me. I didn't find real estate, but I am proud to be a member of this community where we do excellent work for our clients, where I can also do this job at age 57 and know that I can do this for the rest of my life. It is not a limiting opportunity. So where it, this is the most democratic of professions, where people can, can earn a living, provide to our community, I don't understand why we're targeted. CPAs are not required to charge only one amount to do a tax return. They can charge anything. It can be $140, it can be $4,000. Attorneys, attorneys are not required to charge the same exact fee for the same service, you know, for the same representation. If that were true, then every single person should be represented by a public defender, and there should, you know, and have, you know, equanimity across the board. Why are you doing it to a profession where people, we, we work hard, we come to this, many of us come after first and second careers, we want to do good work, we are people that want to do good work for our clients. We work with honesty, integrity. We believe in transparency. We support you in that. And as I said, let's figure out how to do that. The Department of State requirement where we have to disclose to people um, whether or not we are working for the landlord or working for the tenants. I believe in that. I am proud to be able to tell people that. I tell them it's because there has been confusion in the past as to who you're representing in the market. We want you to know. We want to be transparent. And I'm sure I am like many, many agents here who already offer clients a one-month fee because we believe it's much better to get one-month fee than 100% of nothing. All right, so we are already doing that. To have that flexibility and negotiation opportunity is essential. I, I'm wrapping up, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Um, and, and no, I, I feel your passion. Yeah, and I, and I just want to let you know that we, we, we do want to work with clients and negotiate with them. We are not the people that your legislation is targeting. We want those bad actors out of, out of our industry. We want to show our, our license. We want to show our revenue card. We want to do good work and have excellence, and that's why most of us that are making enough money are doing it because we get referral business from the clients who have been proud to pay our fees and are happy to introduce other people to us. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. And just uh, on the record, um, thank you for representing us over 50 folks so well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Me too. <laughs> My name is Gus Wade. I'm a licensed real estate uh, salesperson, and uh, I want to first say I appreciate your guys' patience. I know it's sitting up there and listening, and I really feel listened to, and that's a real art that's been lost, I think, in politics, is the art of listening, so thank you for that. And um, I also want to thank the folks who showed up who are advocating for homeless people, broke people, people who are struggling to get into housing, and I would say all of us. Uh, without a doubt, support those efforts to make that happen. Um, the challenge is, and listen, I, 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 I got to just tell you, I love New York. I got off a train in 1974. I had a crazy uncle who had a Hagen dazs ice cream store on Christopher and Bleecker. And I was a blonde-headed, blue-eyed kid from Connecticut. My first person I met in New York was a six-foot-six six drag queen on roller skates in a fairy godmother outfit. And, uh, and I said, I got to move there, man. This is my town. And uh, got out of high school, moved here to become an actor. Uh, and, and, you know, I wish back then, and I found my lease from 1981, I rented, uh, I was making 400 bucks a week as a short order cook at my father's restaurant. And I rented a studio at 163 West 79th Street for $321 a month. And I wish there was a way that we or you could bring back those days. I wish there was a way that we could bring back the days where someone could move to New York and want to be an actor and get a job flipping hamburgers and could live, afford to live here. But those days aren't here now, and this doesn't do anything to solve that. And so, you know, as I, as I look through this, I just wanted to bring up a few things that hadn't been said before as solutions. I think we would all support, you want to make it so that there's a link on every ad to the Department of State that shows our record with the Department of State, that shows we're legitimate, that shows we don't have complaints against us, that shows that we've never been brought up against charges. 
Do you want to have a link to Rebney and an explanation of what Rebney is and why that's important? I think that the more transparency, if you want to have transparency around the broker fee in the ad, that is absolutely fine um, and, and would be something that I would uh, be all for. And here's the other thing. The rich folks are going to be fine. The rich folks are going to be no problem. It's the poor people that are going to suffer. How many times have you taken out someone because you felt bad for them? because they had a $1,700 budget and you knew you were going to run around for a month and put three or $400 in your pocket. And you said, you know what? I like that person. I'm going to work with them because you know what? The Goldman Sachs guy that's coming in, I'm going to be able to charge him 15% because he's making $600,000 a year. And I'm going to be able to balance out my income because I'm going to work with people who don't have a lot of money and once in a while get lucky with people who do have a lot of money. Um, the other thing that concerns me about this is I can already hear the confusion from the public when I tell them that I charge a 15% broker fee to work with them when they say to me, but I thought it was illegal to charge more than one month. Because that's what the public is going to hear. And that's what the corporations are going to hear that we are able to charge 15 and 13 and a half and 15% to. What the corporations, the Goldman Sachs's of the world are going to hear is, hey, guess what? Broker fees are only a month now. That's all we're paying you. And they're going to try to squeeze the fees down. So for all of those reasons, I'm against this legislation. And thank you for listening. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Will Chabot, and today I'm reading testimony on behalf of Parag Sarva, who is the CEO and co-founder of the insurance startup Rhino. My name is Parag Sarva, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Rhino. Our mission is to make renting more affordable and easy by replacing security deposits with low-cost insurance. Our elected officials at the state level and members of this body have been hard at work to address obstacles to secure affordable housing faced by millions of New Yorkers. In New York City, renters are facing unprecedented financial challenges. Millennials under 35 have median savings of just $1,500, while they are faced with an average rent price in New York City of $3,500 per month, and these prices continue to grow every year. Upfront costs, mostly in the form of traditional security deposits, are the primary barrier to many looking for a home. The current model of paying traditional security deposits continues to lock up millions in hard-earned cash from everyday New Yorkers, New Yorkers, a staggering $507 million in 2016 alone, according to a report released by Comptroller Scott Stringer last year. Security deposits make up as much as 50% of moving costs, with most of it locked away in escrow accounts, earning nearly 0% interest. Steep security deposit costs prevent New Yorkers from upgrading their living situations, moving neighborhoods, and saving for the future. While the proposal in the City Council would specifically cap brokers' fees and recent laws passed in Albany cap security deposits to one month's rent, most New Yorkers already only pay one month's rent as a security deposit, so the typical New Yorker wouldn't see much of an impact from this proposal. People simply don't have the savings to keep deposits locked up for no good reason when they have to pay off student debt or health bills, secure childcare, or invest for the future. Technology and innovation are creating new opportunities to replace the old way of doing business and reduce transaction costs. Specific to, the, specific to rental transactions, breakthroughs in insurance over the last three years have made it possible to replace the age-old cash security deposit that are burdens for both renters and landlords with affordable insurance programs. The insurance assumes the risk and guarantees the repair of damages or unpaid rent, coverage that is still essential for the landlord, while lifting the burden from renters up front and allowing them to instead pay a low monthly premium. To further help renters, the City Council should pass a bill that requires landlords to offer renters an insurance option instead of the cash security deposit to secure their homes. There are already forward-thinking landlords who provide an alternative choice to the traditional security deposit, but as you know, the housing affordability crisis is an urgent problem for New Yorkers and we can't wait idly for the entire real estate industry to catch up to this practice that has such significant benefits for those struggling to find a home today. We need legislation to provide an immediate solution to this problem. We look forward to working together in the future to ensure that housing is affordable and accessible to all New Yorkers. Thank you. So we've come to the end of this hearing. I want to thank you all for your testimony. I want to thank you for your patience. I need to let you know that it was important to hear every single voice. 
Uh, for those people who didn't get in today, I'm, I'm sorely disappointed as well, but we only have a certain amount of capacity in the building. It had nothing to do with anything other than capacity and trying to manage a very large crowd of people. Um, but I think you represented those people who weren't able to get in very, very well. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. You can clap now. <laughs>